Hi, you guys. Welcome to tonight's Ask the Egg Whisperer. Thank you for sending all your questions in. This has been um, a challenging time for all of us, and you guys probably know that being a fertility doctor isn't all about giving people good news every single day. I really wish it, it was like that. I mean, that would be awesome if you just came to see me and it would be like unicorns and rainbows and, you know, sparkles and sprinkles. <laughs> but the reality is, what we do as fertility doctors is we are resilience builders. You guys are here, you're watching me right now because you guys are sparkling. You are hoping for the greatest love in your life and you're gonna listen to these shows to learn as much as you can. But at the same time, you guys are extremely resilient. And I see patients where sometimes I have to almost be a resilience coach. So I just thought it'd be really fun to just start off while you guys are you know, starting to tune in to tonight's show to talk a little bit about resilience. And I think you know what's coming next. About a couple of weeks ago, I talked to you guys about embryo diamonds and, you know, that's basically all the information you need to know about your embryos, but I'm not going to go through that this moment, but I want to talk about resilience. And I did something pretty cool. Let me just show it to you. So anytime, you know, I think one of the things that people say to me is, I just don't know where to go when I get bad news. And that's like one of the hardest things as a fertility doctor is to talk people through bad results. And I think that a lot of what I do is kind of, you know, taking people through bad results and letting them know that you have to go through the negative so that you get closer to the positive. But resilience is so much a part of that. So I'm just going to read through what I just showed you. Um, basically the resilience is just a beautiful mnemonic to remember, rise up, endure the battle, strengthen yourself, identify the challenge, lean in, inhale, exhale, just like I just did. Think about the next step, change what you can and embrace the journey. I didn't come up with this by myself. Someone pretty darn brilliant did. And I thank you for it. Thank you for sending this to me because I think a lot of people can remember that word resilience. You have a negative pregnancy test, remember resilience. Listen to this, you know, read this mnemonic, read it to yourself over and over again. And I hope that it will really, really help you. So on that note, I'm going to start answering your questions. So the first question I have is, hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for all the work you're doing and for giving us the opportunity to ask questions. I listened with great interest to your last show on the ERA test, and I would like to know whether an ERA can be done to figure out the best implantation window in the case of a natural FET cycle. For those of you who are tuning in, you don't really know much about the IVF nuts and bolts and all these little three letter words. Let me break it down. Basically, IVF is where we take medications to create embryos, right? So egg and sperm come together, make an embryo. That's step one. Step two is embryo transfer preparation. So that's how you get ready for putting an embryo inside your uterus. And then step three is doing the actual transfer. So you can think of it as three steps, three stages, three months, something like that. So a lot of people do this ERA testing and the answer is yes, I do them in natural cycle transfers as well because I want to get it right. I want to know exactly when I should be taking the trigger shot. I want to know exactly what time I should be doing that transfer so that I never look back and say, oh, I wonder if the reason why this test is negative is because I didn't get the timing right. And remember, before you do something, always ask yourself this question. If this transfer didn't work, what would I have done? or sorry, if this transfer didn't work, what will I do differently next time? If you ask that question, sometimes it makes you rethink your approach so that you would do what you would do next time, this time. So that's why asking that question is pretty helpful. Next question. Hi, Dr. Amy. I had an FET done four days ago with a natural cycle. The embryo was donated. It was not PGS tested. However, survived the thaw and it's really good quality. The transfer went really well. An ERA test was done. It showed that I was pre-receptive, so we followed those rules for our transfer. I'm 44 years old, never been pregnant or miscarried. I had five failed IUIs using donor sperm. What is the likelihood of success? That is a great question, and that's easy to answer. Remember, Embryo quality depends on age, the age of the egg source, sperm source, their genetics and the environment, right? And so that's the thing. It really depends on the age of the gametes that you use, especially the egg source. So if let's say you have a gorgeous 38 year old embryo, I mean, uh, not 38 year old embryo, but a gorgeous embryo that was created with eggs from a 38 year old woman, then maybe that embryo has, you know, 
statistically speaking, maybe like a 25 to 30% chance of being genetically normal. And if it were normal and it has high quality, then it has a super high chance of pregnancy, maybe over 60%. So go back to your paperwork, look at the age of the egg and sperm source, and you'd be able to figure out that answer as well. But that's a great question. Here's another question. Do you have any secrets for premature ovarian failure? I've had it for 10 years now and we want a baby so bad. Okay. First of all, I hate anything that ends with failure, right? So we use another word, primary ovarian insufficiency, but the other term for it, for it is premature menopause. Menopause is obviously a dirty word in my clinic. We don't like it around here. I'm joking, of course. Obviously, it's part of the normal human experience. We all have it, but at the end of the day, if you run out of healthy eggs, it doesn't mean that you run out of your desire to have a pregnancy. So depending on your age, get a full workup. See if you have anti-adrenal, anti-ovarian antibodies. Look at anti-thyroid antibodies. There are some special tricks that I use for my patients to help them ovulate if they have POI, like perhaps starting estrogen, monitoring FSH levels, and then when the FSH levels come down, maybe start a fertility drug and see if that will help. See if you can get an egg to ovulate. And talk to a doctor that has experience in doing this and believes that there is still a chance. And at the end of the day, trying doesn't hurt anybody. So maybe try for one to three months and see what happens. And then you can start talking about other options, egg donation, embryo donation, adoption. There's so many amazing ways of being a parent in 2020 and beyond. Next question here. Let's see here. Hi, Dr. Amy and friends. That's nice. I'm 33. I've had a diagnosis of less than a 2% chance of having a baby naturally because of PCOS. Okay. First of all, guys, PCOS, as you know, is hope syndrome, right? That's what I call it. It just stands for having hair growth or high levels of androgens, ovaries with lots of follicles, periods that are regular, and you just got to pay attention to eating and exercise. That's it. Anyone who tells you you're infertile, sorry, but not sorry, but no, but there's more to this. So I digress. Um, because of PCOS and male factor. So male factor, that's a different story. I've always suspected IVF would be my journey and I had substantiated this at a clinic after investigation phase. We were told we needed ICSI, okay? So ICSI, you guys, is where you take the most sparkling, beautiful sperm and put it into the egg, okay? We've tried for three years, we've been together for 13, married for three, and ironically used protection for 10 out of the 13 years. Mostly our issues are from male factor infertility. Our first IVF cycle resulted in 24 eggs, 19 fertilized, two blasts, one genetically normal. Wow. With the hope at the beginning of our IVF cycle of eight to 10 mature eggs and this outcome, my wondering is, is this normal? After watching numerous videos, I feel more and more that I should have taken a more conservative approach to get pregnant, and this is what we did. My second antagonist cycle resulted in seven follicles, estimated before retrieval, but I ended up getting 20 eggs, 14 fertilized, 10 to day three, and at day five, we had two that were viable for freezing, but not viable for testing. So there were no blasts in her second cycle. So her questions are this, here we go. I'm a little stunned and disappointed that cycle over cycle, we rendered almost identical results. Any thoughts on this, why this might be? And the thing is, it could be from sperm quality, for example. So I don't know what genetic tests you've done on the sperm. Have you done chromosome analysis, Y chromosome microdeletion and sperm DNA fragmentation? I think all of these things are really important as well as having your, your partner see a male uh, urology or male fertility specialist. They can check under the hood, squeeze the testicles. We actually have squeezy scrotums here. <laughs> If you're my patient, you know that. You can squeeze the scrotum when you get your blood drawn. That is not a joke. It really isn't. Um, see if he has a varicocele. Consider other things like adding Pixie or Zymote as well to your cycle. That might also help. What she also shares is that she wants three kids. And that's just so heartbreaking because after two cycles, she has had one normal embryo, but it's still pretty great that you were able to get the one. The other question is... Um, uh, let's see here. My nurses requested that I stop fish oil during my antagonist cycle, and I've heard you mention it. Is this something that I should stop as well? And I never want to go against what your doctor says or your nurses say at your clinic, so I would say just do what they say. If you are my patient, I have my patients stay on their stimulation, uh, sorry, their supplements throughout their cycle. So the next question is, what is the average blast formation rate? And every clinic is different, and you should know what that number is 
by asking that clinic. So for example, in the IVF lab that I use and what I experience with my patients, the blast formation rate seems to be around 50 to 60%, which is pretty darn awesome. So you've heard me say this before, half of a half of a half, right? So I don't know if I'm gonna do this right, right now on the spot, but you get like half the mature eggs of the follicles and half fertilized and half turn into blastocysts. And that's pretty average. Um, so um, this quote is just, very touching that I'm going to read right now. And it just, you know, makes me feel so good about these shows, the fact that you guys are sending in your questions and that I can have this opportunity to share my experience with you. And she says, your show makes me feel like you are my proverbial fairy godmother, the egg whisperer of IVF and has given me a gentle rub on the back and has said, everything will be okay. And you will be a mother someday. Just be patient. I hate being patient. You guys know I'm not patient. I want everything yesterday, but I appreciate you saying that. And that kind of rhymes too. And maybe I'll turn that into a song and I'll sing it and annoy the hell out of my heck out of my sister because she hates it when I sing on this show. But she's not trolling me today. She's constantly trolling me about the fact that I wear blue every single time I come on here. Um, here's another great question. Um, thank you for taking these questions and answering them for, for us. I'm 31, almost 32, and I've been trying to conceive for almost two years. My husband and I finally decided to seek expert advice from a fertility specialist about eight months ago. We received positive news that all tests came back with no issues for either one of us, HSG, ultrasound, semen analysis. The only item that came back a little bit low was my AMH hormone level. And they said that it was a little bit low for my age. Remember, she's 31, almost 32. And the follicle count was 11. I do have a mild form of hypothyroidism, but managed to keep a TSH between two to four and monitor it regularly. I've been prescribed Clomid, what I call Clomonster, 100 milligrams, to ovulate in the hopes that I release several eggs and increase my chance of fertility as they cannot find any physical or hormonal reason why we cannot conceive. In the last months, however, my periods have been weird, where I start spotting red, purple, and brown blood with clots anywhere from day 21 to 28 before an actual period starting. Hmm, I bet you guys know what I'm going to say next. Here are her questions. Can you actually get pregnant if you're spotting around the time of the implantation window? And the answer is, let's figure out why. Why are you spotting like this? Even though you've had an HSG, obviously there's something going on. Have them either repeat an HSG or do, maybe your doctor can do this even faster and easier, a saline infusion sonogram to rule out a uterine or cervical polyp that could be causing the spotting. Because that could be an implantation barrier inside your uterus and that can prevent an embryo from sticking and growing and that could be part of the explanation. The other thing is that it could also be a sign of low progesterone. You guys know me well, progesterone's like water to a marathon runner. Don't be that person that doesn't give a marathon runner water until the end of the race. No one's going to be that person, right? I mean, that's just mean. Like, you would never watch the New York Marathon and be like, let's not give them water. That just seems horrible. Same thing for embryos. Those poor embryos are traveling down the fallopian tube for almost an entire week before they land in the uterus. So if you're spotting, it could be a sign of low progesterone. And I strongly suggest you talk to your doctor about that and request a prescription for progesterone and see if that'll fix it. I would say that 9.9 .9 out of 10 fertility doctors would agree that that is a strategy that they would use in that kind of situation. The next question, is there any explanation for this type of spotting? Yes, low progesterone, uterine polyp, and then figure out if it's low progesterone, why is the progesterone low? Could this be an egg quality issue and you want to address it? I want you to have more than one child if that's what you want. And given the fact that you're 32 with a slightly low AMH, remember my egg whisper golden rules. Preserve your fertility by freezing your eggs. And if you're partnered and you want kids with him again in the future, <laughs> just kidding, um, freeze embryos. Actually, um, something really funny happened today. Someone asked me, um, what can I do? The husband asked, like, what can I do to prepare for the IUI? And um, I said, well, you are you have to do all the house chores and you have to cook and you have to clean and not let your wife pick up anything because that's called foreplay. <laughs> it really is, right? Right, everybody? Come on, you have to agree. Um, so she also talks about doing the proved test and would my proved test still be positive if I'm spotting? And the answer is yes your proof test could still be positive even if you're spotting because the proof test wouldn't know if there's an anatomic issue like a polyp. The proof test just confirms ovulation by looking at a metabolite of progesterone. And then does spotting past uh, or spotting day 21 
indicate that the progesterone has uh, dropped? And the answer is not necessarily. Okay, here is the next question. Thank you guys for staying with me and listening in. You know, I could talk about this all day long, and there obviously is a limit to how much one person can talk. But not me. When it comes to fertility, there really is no limit. You should see me at parties. I just talk about fertility. <laughs> next question. Dr. Amy, thank you for everything you do to help educate everyone on a very confusing topic. I've learned so much from you. Well, thank you for that. That is very sweet. I'm 34, went through one failed IVF cycle. Boo. Um, I hate that too. Three eggs retrieved and ended up with two fair and good three-day embryos, not PGS tested. Both transfers failed. I'll need to do another retrieval. What can I do to, in the future to produce more eggs and have a better success after transfer? And here are her numbers, okay? AMH is 0.65 and everything else is normal, FSH, estradiol. I've been taking CoQ10, vitamin D, 75 of DHEA for the last month. And then here she's asking, do you suggest priming for a month or so? I've heard women prime with omnitrope and low-dose naltrexone. Okay, so yeah, I think priming with IGA with HGH is a great idea. Talk to your doctor about it and make sure that you're a candidate for it. I typically start at one or two cycles before the next IVF cycle, and it could even be one or two weeks before. I've even started like four days before. So we don't know the answer as to whether longer is better as far as HGH. We just don't. Um, and because like no one's going to do a randomized double-blind controlled clinical trial around that subject because that's just very expensive and you know I don't see anyone doing that but for purposes of what I try to do with my patients I use my experience both anecdotal and stuff that I've learned you know through you know fertility baby making school and HGH seems to help some women I don't know why it doesn't help all women but certainly I've seen some really really impressive results so that maybe next time you might have more follicles than this time but at the end of the day you really need to repeat your amh look at your fsh again track and trend the levels and really make a a very calculated decision as to whether you should move forward with this next IVF cycle. Now that you've had this experience, one thing to think through is what protocol is the best for my body? Did I use birth control pills? Could that have suppressed my ovaries? Because if your AMH is 0.65, I would expect more than five follicles to be growing. So repeat your AMH and see if maybe that isn't, it isn't as high. Because if your AMH is really 0.3, maybe three follicles is what the expectation should be. So I think it's so important to know where you're at in the moment with your cycle, and then have a doctor that's able to kind of help you understand what's going on so that with your next cycle, you know all the information and you make a decision based on all the information you're going for in a cycle that's really good. I also like to add two other supplements, NAD, pterostilbene, or you can get something like a Cyberry or Resveratrol, something like that, something in that family. Really high dose antioxidants, I think can help some people, plant-based diet, sleeping well, meditating, connect with humans, like, not just, I mean, you can touch humans, but connect with, I mean, not like connect, connect, but you know what I'm saying? Like through online support groups, one-on-one -on -one therapy, find your tribe, find your posse and, uh, and find your happiness. And then your resilience. For those of you guys who are joining, we talked about resilience, um, at the start of this show. So thank you guys for staying with me. So she has more questions. Do, do you suggest an ERA before my next transfer or maybe rolling the dice and testing my limited number of embryos? So my answer to that is yes, I always recommend an ERA when we're dealing with a limited number of embryos. We roll dice. We shouldn't be rolling embryos. That should be a t-shirt. <laughs> Seriously, guys, that should be like a bumper sticker. You roll dice. You don't roll embryos, but it just feels like that. When you're an IVF doctor, it feels like a lot of the time you're like, let's roll these embryos and see what's going to happen. And I hate that about what I do. And I wish I had better tests than just like the tushy method, but I kind of like the tushy method because I'm the one that came up with it. <laughs> so she adds more. Luckily, I have another uterus on hand. Hmm. My wife's. Maybe we should try transferring the embryo into hers. And the answer is, yeah, that is a great option, transferring into your wife's uterus. And then that allows you to continue to do more cycles while she's pregnant with your guys' babies. I think that's a win-win. I think that's pretty brilliant. Assuming, of course, she wants to get pregnant. And then if she does, don't roll the dice. Do an ERA test on her. Talk to your doctor about that and see if they agree. Okay, here's another question. Here's my background. I'll be 38 in October. My AMH is 0.75. My FSH is 11.7. I have mild endometriosis. We conceived our son in 2017 at the age of 34 after one round of IVF, which resulted in five blasts and one normal embryo. My reproductive endocrinologist, that's a mouthful, at the time didn't suggest banking more embryos. 
which is heartbreaking in hindsight because we had the worst luck trying to conceive baby number two. Here is what happened. Here we go, August, 2019. Out of eight follicles, got four eggs, and my AMH dropped from 2.7 to 0.75. November, 2019, canceled. Poor response. We only expected two eggs. 2020, one blast, transferred it, and it resulted in a miscarriage. Swiss for, switched fertility doctors, and then they did a different protocol, added HGH, retrieved 10 eggs out of nine follicles. We were so hopeful. Two made it to blast, but only one was good enough to freeze, and the results came back abnormal. We're crushed and sure of where to go from here. We have a consult next week. I don't know what, that I'm ready to give up on my own eggs just yet. Please help. What do you recommend? And these are the supplements that she's on. CoQ10 in the form of ubiquinol, NAC, vitamin D, E, C, prenatal, DHA. My husband's sperm is good, but he isn't the healthiest. He smokes and drinks. Wondering if we should check sperm DNA fragmentation or if this is definitely because of my eggs. Ah, answer is right there, people. Sperm, right? Every embryo takes an egg and a sperm cell. I tell my patients, if your husband smokes, I'm not going to take care of you. <laughs> no, I don't really say that. That's really mean. I say, get him in here and I'm going to talk to him, just me and him. It's just going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. So this is the thing. I mean, we go through so much as women, like the shots and the blood draws and the ultrasounds, the poking and the probing, sleeves up, pants down, surgery, and then he's going to sit there and smoke while you're going through this and decrease your chance of pregnancy by 50%. Uh-uh, that's not happening around here. So I would highly suggest doing a DNA fragmentation test. And I think even if the sperm DNA fragmentation comes back normal, the smoking could still be affecting the sperm DNA and the chromosomes of the sperm. So we know that. It's not like I'm making this up. And I know people that say, oh yeah, but all my friends smoke and they have no problems getting pregnant. I'm like, your friends haven't done like a thousand IVF cycles. So just stop smoking. I mean, just don't like, it's as simple as that. So the answer is absolutely. I've seen incredible differences. And I've, I've had those patients myself where they're like, I'm not going to stop smoking. And then I just like rub my nose here very carefully. And then they do the IVF cycle. And then of course it doesn't work out. Not of course, of course I don't want to like prove a point by going through an IVF cycle that doesn't work. And then the next cycle is like, voila, we have these gorgeous embryos. And I'm just like, I told you so. So at 38, you know, if your husband is a smoker, tell him to stop, please. Two and a half months, you can do a baseline DNA frag now. You can repeat it about two weeks before your anticipated IVF stem start so that you can see the improvement. And hopefully that will really, really help. Put him through a sperm, th I'm not gonna raise my arms too high because it's COVID and uh, I haven't shaved my armpits. <laughs> That's true, true story. I'm not gonna prove it to you. Um, it's true. <laughs> I have to be careful not to do that. That's why I keep my hair nice and long. But my point is that put him through sperm fitness course, supplements, exercise most days of the week, plant-based diet, no smoking, no marijuana, no alcohol, no hot tubs, convert to Mormonism. <laughs> I joke about that too. I love Mormons. I would be Mormon, except I drink like seven cups of coffee a day. I really would. All my really good friends are Mormon. It's true. Okay. Next question. I digressed on that one a little bit, but that was kind of fun. Next question. I'm doing a frozen embryo transfer. Do you have any supplements that you recommend? I do. I do. Okay, here we go. Prenatal, vitamin D, fish oil. If you have PCOS, consider making sure that your hormones are balanced, testosterone is low before you start, TSH, vitamin D, all that good stuff. I know I just said vitamin D. Consider adding other things like metformin if needed, and acetylcysteine, lipoic acid, uh, CoQ10. If you have uh, endometriosis before your transfer, consider adding also N-acetylcysteine and CoQ10. If you have a history of miscarriages, and of course, the information that you're getting here, I feel like, you know, those commercials were like Viagra, you could, you know, this, this, and that. Um, I feel like I should add a disclaimer that obviously you guys know that I'm not your doctor. I'm just kind of giving you, you know, suggestions as if you were my patient and what I would do. But just because I'm talking about this doesn't mean your doctor is going to agree with me. And they might tell you to never listen to me. Be like, oh, stop listening to that Dr. Amy. But then that doesn't hurt my feelings. Not even a little bit, maybe. Um, but CoQ10 is something that if you've had miscarriages before, there is a really nice study that I found looking at T cells in our body and how it can potentially change them and help prevent miscarriage. And so I do suggest for my patients, my patients, that um, they take CoQ10, especially if they've had a history of miscarriages or they have endometriosis, have some sort of autoimmune condition, and they take it through 
uh, the first trimester, if they can tolerate it, of course, because no one wants to take pills when you're like throwing up um, more than they need to. Here's another question. Can I use three milligrams of melatonin during my frozen embryo transfer? And the answer is, if you are my patient, the answer would be yes. And during the two-week wait, if you are my patient, the answer is yes. Having really good sleep is really, really important. Please know that you know melatonin hasn't really been studied in pregnancy. There is a study looking at it, and it shows that maybe it might be neuroprotective for the baby and actually might be good for um, pregnancy. But I would rather have my patients take melatonin than, let's say, use THC or other products to help with their sleep, like Ambien or Lunesta. So for me, it's a yes, but obviously ask your doctor. Next question. Oh, this is just a PS. My husband and I always watch your videos, and we love you. Thank you. If we have a daughter, we will name her after you, Amy. Okay, that's really sweet. Here's another question. Um, I'm 36 years old and my husband is 38. My husband and I have been trying to start a family for three years and have been unsuccessful. We have three miscarriages. I'm really sorry about that. Two failed egg retrievals. I hate that too. Our IVF doctor told us to look at an egg donor. I'm quite competitive, so hold tight on that. I have a duplication on the short arm of the X chromosome, so we had to get a probe made for genetic testing. The first egg retrieval, they got 16 eggs. One egg made it after day five. Uh, one egg made it the five days after and went to genetic testing and came back abnormal. The second retrieval, we got 12 eggs, five fertilized, and zero made it into embryos. My question to you is this. Is it worth it to go to a different doctor and get a second opinion? Is it worth the large expense to go through another IVF round? How should we pick another clinic with my genetic conditions? Okay, so that's really, really tough. At 36, each egg has, uh, I think it's around, I have to look just quick, do, 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 do. 36 years old, probably around 40, uh, 30 to 40% chance that each egg is going to be genetically normal. So with that in mind, having a, you know, a genetic issue that could potentially affect 50% of your embryos, that's really, really tough. So after two cycles where you aren't successful, you have to say this, in five years from now, will I look back and say, I wish I had done a third cycle? If the answer is yes, go do it. You know, add more supplements, make sure you've done everything that I've talked about earlier on the show, as far as HDH priming, adding more supplements, living your best life today and healthiest life and looking at sperm DNA and making sure you're not missing things on the, on your husband's side. What if he also has a chromosome abnormality and that's also, you know, causing the issues that you're having. So I think that those are all the things to look at and then ask yourself that one question. If the answer is, I'm just going to be happy that I moved on and got, you know, became a parent and stopped becoming a patient, then just move on. Egg donation is an amazing way, a wonderful way to have a family and you don't have to look back and you don't have to, you know, there's no shame in it at all. Embryo donation is also awesome. And like all the other options of being a parent, you have to do what's right for you. And, you know, there's a great quote, Jana Rupnow, she, it's on her, uh, in her book and it's a uh, plan B is the plan that was meant to be. It's not plan B. It's not like second best. It's just what was meant to be because all the stuff that you're doing right now is leading you to what is supposed to make you a mom. And like, it just sucks that you've gone through three miscarriages, two IVF cycles that didn't work. And you just get to that point where you're like, enough is enough. Like, let's just move on. And if you're there, go for it. If you're not, then yeah, I think if you want to do one more cycle, I think it's okay after you look at all the stuff that I just kind of mentioned. Okay, here is another question. Let's see here. I see the word unexplained in there, and you know how that makes my skin crawl. Here we go. I'm in a bit of a tricky situation with my doctor. <laughs> I'll be starting, I don't know why I was laughing about that. Um, there's nothing to laugh about. Uh, I will be starting IVF soon. I tried asking my IVF nurse about supplements, but she almost wouldn't let me ask. Boo, you know my mantra, ask more questions. That's lame, okay. She said the doctor only recommends a prenatal and maybe vitamin D. Anything else he won't recommend, but if I want to take them, I can. That's fine. That's fair enough. I mean, that's kind of like supporting it. I've seen an acupuncturist for about three months now, and she approved my supplements and added a couple, and I was hoping to get them approved by the doctor too, but he doesn't believe in supplements or acupuncture for egg quality. That's okay. He doesn't have to believe in it. We know that they work for some people, and that's okay. My question is this. I have undiagnosed secondary infertility, normal pelvic ultrasound, Normal HSG, semen analysis with 97 million, 67% motility, hormones are normal, I'm waiting on genetic results. I'm taking a prenatal vitamin D, 400 of CoQ10, terostilbene, a berry, fish oil, vasotel, prometrium supplements, three days post ovulation due to, due to spotting before my period. I am 29 years old, had a missed miscarriage December of 2019, struggled to get pregnant with my first baby for two years. 
Would everything I'm taking be safe to continue through an IVF egg retrieval? And here are some of the numbers. FSH 5.86, AMH 7.44, TSH 2.48, LH 7.3. Thank you for answering my questions. Okay, so this is the thing. There's a reason why something's not working. At the age of 29, you have to wonder what it is. And so I think that knowing what your genetic test results are, especially the chromosome analysis for you and your husband will be really important. We know that 30 to 40% of guys who have a normal semen analysis can have an abnormal DNA fragmentation. The likelihood with a semen analysis of 97 million with 67% motility is probably pretty low. And the other thing that I always think about is endometriosis. Could this all be related to endometriosis causing inflammation in your body, decreasing your implantation rate, even when you're trying naturally and maybe affecting your egg qualities? It's possible based on what you're going through and what you've experienced at the age of 29. I would suggest, you know, especially it says here, struggle to get pregnant for two years prior for her first baby. I don't want you to go through the same thing for two more years. So you have to wonder if maybe there's either a tubal motility issue, like your fallopian tubes are open, but they're just not peristalsing in the right way. A fertilization issue related to something in the egg or something in the sperm. <laughs> sperm is not that big, you guys, just not. That is not a sperm cell. Um, you know, those are the, the things that we can't really test for. Um, so, I mean, I would say doing IVF makes perfect sense. And all the things that you're taking, if you are my patient, would be perfectly safe to take during an IVF cycle. So that was really her question, because it sounds like her doctor is saying you can take them if you want. And I'm saying, if you are my patient, it's okay to take them. Okay, here's another question. Hi, Dr. Amy, I recently had an FET, which is a frozen embryo transfer that ended in a miscarriage at six and a half weeks with a high grade PGS tested embryo. I did the ERA test. We did the transfer on the right day. I was wondering what should my progesterone level be before and after the frozen embryo transfer? So this is the answer. Before the frozen embryo transfer, on the lining check day, you want it to be less than one. I like it to be around 0 0.5. On the transfer day, I don't check progesterone level, but if there's a concern that someone's having a reaction to the progesterone, I'll check it. I like it to be at least 20 if you're doing intramuscular progesterone. The next week with a pregnancy test that's positive either way. I always check progesterone with my HCG levels. I like the progesterone level to be over 20, ideally around 30. And again, we always talk about, are you having a reaction? Should we add more? There's no such thing as too much progesterone, unless you're getting super dizzy and feel like you're going to puke your brains out, then it's probably a good idea to reduce the dose depending on what your levels are. So here's another question. Um, wondering if my progesterone level was higher, would that have helped and prevent some of the cramping and spotting that I was having? I mean, I don't know that cramping, I mean, the question is like, hello, why are you having cramping and spotting, right? I mean, there's something going on. So the, the, the fact that your transfer didn't work could be related to an undiagnosed polyp, even though you had the ERA test, have them do a saline sonogram again and look consider a hysteroscopy. That's kind of what I would think. And then she also adds, what should the estrogen level be before and after my FET? My estrogen level was 118, then dropped to 96. After the first week, I was told to increase my dose and it needed to be over a hundred. I have seen others whose estrogen levels are much higher than mine. Do you think mine was too low? And this could have been why I had cramping, spotting, and eventual uh, failed implantation. And I like my estrogen levels to be around 150 and I like to titrate my dose accordingly. Um, I don't know that estrogen level being 118 and dropping to 96 is the reason why an embryo didn't stick. However, you know, you have to wonder, like, you know, I would say not wonder, I'm not wondering. I'm just saying that you have to think that maybe your levels dropping could have had something to do with the fact that you were spotting and if you were pregnant, potentially the spotting wouldn't have occurred. So next time, and I hate that you have to learn this the hard way, obviously, you know, maybe consider using a patch. For some people, when they swallow pills, you don't get that even distribution in your bloodstream and using a patch might help, patch, or doing a shot in your butt, and I promise I won't show you my butt, not today at least, <laughs> or ever. There's never gonna be a time, you guys, that I'm gonna show you my butt and do a shot. I've done that on one of my YouTube shows, but not today. So potentially using an estrogen shot every three days might be another way of keeping your levels nice and high and nice and steady so they don't drop and you won't have the same issue next time. But I have to wonder, you guys did the ERA test, the same thing should have been monitored in the ERA test because I monitor those things as well. So if you guys who are listening are thinking about doing the ERA test, I think one of the best learning uh, 
points that come out of this question is be sure to check your estrogen and progesterone at your lining check for your MOX cycle with the ERA and at your biopsy, right? That's the whole point. Don't, you're not doing this shit for um, shits and giggles, right? I mean, like this stuff is not fun as far as the ERA test. I mean, I try and make it fun, but at the end of the day, it's kind of annoying. You just think of it as work. And you want to take advantage of the ERA cycle to learn as much about your body, how you absorb these medications. So get those levels checked at your lining check and at your biopsy. That's what I do. And ask your doctor for it if you would like to, too. Okay. Here's another question. This is a great one. I'm in the middle of IVF and taking progesterone and oil in my hips and the level of pain feels unbearable. And I want to get another opinion of what you suggest for your, for your patients. I know I can take Tylenol every six hours, but I can barely walk normal and wonder if you can make suggestions. So here's the thing. Ask your doctor or nurse, am I using the right needle? See if you switch needles, see if, if you switch needles to either a longer one or a shorter one, if that will help. Add ice, some people like to sit on an ice pack first and then they do the shot and then they sit on more ice or they put a heating pad on their butt. The other thing some people do is they warm their shot first, draw it up in the syringe, wrap it in your uh, heating pad and then give yourself the shot. That's another thing that might help. And then the other thing that you could do is reduce the volume of the shot and add a vaginal insert every single day. So let's say if your volume is one ml, go down to half an ml and do vaginal inserts twice a day, for example. Alternatively, you can do one big shot, go to three inserts every day and then do the shot every other day. So all these tips hopefully will help and then get your cabana boy ready or cabana girl with a handheld vibrator, <laughs> hand massager, not a vibrator. I bet a vibrator would work too, but I don't even want to think about that right now. It's not even Friday. Friday is when I'm super funny. Thursday is when I'm kind of serious, not so funny. So we're going to talk about a handheld massager. Put that up to your butt, massage out the lumps. That should potentially help with some of the pain. Also, some people use a deep tissue roller and they just roll it on their, you know, you know how to do it. YouTube it if you don't, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Here's a great question. Dr. Amy, thanks for your wonderful shows, which have been really helpful. I have a quick question about the IVF stimulation and ovulation. I'll greatly appreciate your answer. I'm day three of my stem. I've injected fall stem on Tuesday and Wednesday, and then up here on Wednesday and this morning. This morning, I detected transparent liquid. I wonder what that is. For my cervix, and I know this occurs right before ovulation. For your reference, my last period was started on August 12th. I didn't have any bleeding at all, even after taking seven days of birth control pills. Based on the above situation, I'm wondering if I'm going to ovulate very soon before the scheduled ultrasound on blood work on Sunday. What is going on? Okay, you guys, listen. When you're on these medications, they make your estrogen levels go up. What happens when your estrogen levels go up? You feel like you're ovulating because you see the egg white cervical mucus, but you're not ovulating. But if you feel like you are and you haven't been given the medication Ganarelix or Cetratide, talk to your clinic. Be like, I don't know. I just feel like I might be ovulating. And then they might roll their eyes and be like, oh my God, you're supposed to feel that way. That's normal. But they should really be telling you guys that up front. Like that's what I tell my patients. In the beginning, when you start shots, you'll feel a little bit nauseous, have a little bit of a headache. After about three to four days, you'll see the egg white cervical mucus. You'll get a little bit more bloated. You know, that's like stuff that your clinic should be telling you. And if they're not, that's okay. But also know that the chance of ovulating in an IVF cycle when you're taking a medication to prevent it, 1%. It is very, very rare to ovulate when you're doing IVF. And that's because we don't just take medications to stimulate the eggs to grow. We also take medications that prevent ovulation. The names of those medications are like Lupron, Cetratide, Ganarelix. There's so many different ways of cooking a cookie. You don't cook cookies. <laughs> You guys know what I'm talking about, baking a cookie or cooking an omelet. I guess you, you make an omelet. Okay, next question. I just want to send you a massive thanks all the way from across the world. I've recently gone through egg freezing and watching your YouTube videos made me feel so much more comfortable and normal about the process. I have a question for today's q and I have PCOS and in my first egg retrieval, I had over 40 follicles and they retrieved 18 eggs and 16 were mature and frozen. I know there isn't a way to test egg quality, but as I'm, as I'm sitting here, I'm wondering if there are any thoughts about if PCOS means your egg quality would be less. I got more eggs and had more follicles than a lot of my other friends. Would that mean that the quality is not as good? I'm 30 years old, had a good AMH. So other than PCOS, everything has been normal. Yes. Exactly. PCOS for a lot of women just means you're blessed with lots and lots of eggs. It doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're sitting there rotting or they're like, no, none of that stuff. 
So I've done beautiful cycles for women who are, let's say, 39 years old. And I usually expect like one to three normal blasts for a 39-year-old. And I've, I've retrieved and I've, I've been so lucky to help her have like, let's say, 10 normal embryos. Yeah, I just said that because she had so many follicles. So that's the thing. PCOS does not mean infertility. PCOS does not mean bad egg quality, but it's a genetic syndrome, right? And we inherit these variants from both parents. And there are some genes that are related to PCOS, like uh, I think it's BMP15. Uh, I have to research, I have to look that up. Looking it up, looking it up I don't remember right now. <laughs> but my point is that, sure, there are situations when you have PCOS where you may not get as many mature eggs and the quality might be lower. But for the most part, the fact that you got as many eggs that you got for your young age of 30 years old, that's awesome. You don't have to worry about other stuff. I mean, obviously we're going to worry because that's just like normal and that's part of like what makes us human is we're always like thinking and worrying and the fact that you've done this is amazing. It means that you are so resilient. For those of you who've missed resilience, once the show's over, please go back to the beginning and um, listen to what I shared about resilience because I think it's pretty powerful. Okay, here's another great question. I love your sense of humor. Well, thank you. Um, we need more compassionate and innovative doctors like you in this world. Thank you. There are a lot of us out there, guys. It's not just me. There's so many doctors just like me out there that love doing, well, we all love what we're doing, but they also love sharing about our knowledge and our experience and educating others. I'm 28 years old, went through three natural miscarriages last year. We get pregnant easily, but we miscarried all three around six to eight weeks. So I'm doing IVF with PGT testing and we found that my AMH is 0.3 to 0.5, my FSH is 12.9 and my follicle count is nine to 10. I did a standard antagonist heist and protocol with five weeks of birth control pills and got eight eggs, but only one abnormal blast. I just finished round two today. I did a microdose Lupron flare and estrogen priming and HGH and we got six eggs. I had a recurrent loss panel, which came back all good. My, my doctor is doing the BCL-6 test next week and going to repeat it to see if my endometritis is gone. If I were your patient, which protocol would you suggest for a third round? If it comes to that, low stents, high stents, again, I respond fairly well. Okay, this is the thing. I think your AMH level is probably pretty wrong. I just feel like it is. I wonder if you had your AMH level checked when you were taking birth control pills. That would be a good explanation because for someone who has a follicle count of nine to 10, an AMH of 0.3 just doesn't quite add up. So repeat your AMH. I'm super curious about what it is and let me know. And then the other thing is birth control pills. Mm -mm. You know, guys, I don't like birth control pills, especially for women who have less than 10 follicles. The reason is in some women and some women are more sensitive than others, especially five weeks of pills that can really suppress your ovaries and make it so much harder for them to wake up for you. It's like, wake up, wake up. You'll need more days of stem, higher amounts of medication to get them to wake up. And then you have sometimes crummy cycles and you're just like, I just don't understand what it was. And it could seriously have been the five weeks of birth control pills. So it sucks to do five weeks of pills, get eight eggs and have one abnormal blast. I mean, I I've lived through cycles just like that. And unfortunately, sometimes you go through all of that and have no blast, even without the birth control pills. But my suggestion is this, consider HGH priming, talk to your doctor if that's a possibility for you. If you have less than eight follicles, especially with what you've been through, consider a slightly different approach. I love the hybrid protocol. Five days of Femera, three to four tablets per night on treatment day three, treatment day one for me is cycle day number two, bring in some Menopure, maybe 300 units per night, get a look really early. I see my patients early and often. I know I always say that. I'm sorry. I'm so annoying. I usually bring them in on treatment day four or five, and most of the time it's day four. So then I have an opportunity to increase the dose of the medications as needed and no birth control pills for me. And estrogen priming for some people, they're pretty sensitive to it as well. So the other thing she mentions is, um, uh, receptiva test. And that's a good test that you can also do. So take advantage of the IVF cycle that you're in. You don't need to do it in a new cycle. You did an egg retrieval, do it the next week, right? I mean, your egg retrieval is ovulation day. You can do the biopsy seven days after your egg retrieval, and then you can have the results and then they can guide you as to whether, let's say doing a fresh transfer, you're a candidate for it or not. So for me, in some cases, when I want to transfer fresh, I want to make sure I know everything about my patient. And so we talk about things like this. Well, if the receptiva test comes back abnormal, perhaps we shouldn't transfer fresh. So those are some conversations to have with your doctor. So having that information is, is sometimes quite helpful. So that's one way to do it. So that when you're doing your next cycle, you're prepared with that information and then you have more options about what you're going to do. Okay. 
Thanks guys for still listening. I could seriously do this all day long. So I have more questions and I'm going to keep answering them. Here we go. Dr. Amy, thanks a lot for your show. It's super helpful. I'm 30 years old. My AMH is high 7.8. My husband's 33 and I did all the tests. They came back normal. We've done two IUIs, which, which failed so far, even though I responded well to letrozole. Do you think I should go ahead and do IVF next or should I keep doing more IUIs? So my thing is this, what's the diagnosis? I know all the tests have come back normal, but what are the possible explanations, right? Go back, do your tushy method again. Make sure you've done the HSG, look at the ultrasound, see if there's any signs of endometriosis or fibroids or polyps or adenomyosis. Take a really close look at the sperm, do the DNA fragmentation testing, look at the morphology, look at all your hormones and see that they're normal. And then lastly, make sure you've done enough genetic screening. And at the end of the day, IVF, no one really needs IV. I mean, some people need it if they have like a genetic condition or really, really low sperm counts. But eventually, you know, at the age of 30, over, I think it's like 80% of people should be getting pregnant within the first year of trying. And if nothing's wrong, you could certainly keep trying. But at the end of the day, you could just go to IVF and say, you know, I'm going to freeze embryos for my future. And then we can still keep trying naturally at home and then keep those embryos if we don't get pregnant on our own. That rhyme too. I don't try to rhyme you guys. I really don't try to. It just kind of happens. I had a patient who told me once that my emails, they all look like haikus. And I don't mean to do that either, but it made me laugh. Okay, here's a great question. Because she started off with saying, first off, I want to say you're an amazing doctor, right? I mean, come on. That's very sweet. I'm not amazing. I just love what I do. And I wish there were more of uh, more like you where I live. Your energy is positive and so informative. I'm 43 years old. I've been trying to conceive for 15 years. God bless you. You are the definition of, you know what I'm going to say, resilience. I should feel like I need to have one of those, like, <laughs> you guys don't know this, but I have a thing that you push buttons and it like, you hear farting noises and burping noises and laughing noises. And one time I was like walking and I kept hearing this, <clears throat> and I swear, I was like, oh my God, people might think, I, I didn't know what was happening. And it turned out that it was in my purse and it kept like getting pushed by something in my purse. So long story longer, I feel like I should have a resilience button and like a song, resilience every time someone reminds me of resilience, because this woman reminds me of resilience, 43 years old, 15 years. I've had two miscarriages, two ectopics. I was uh, having intercourse and the ectopic was in my right tube. It was removed. I had IVF in 2018 and that's where I got the ectopic from. I just had an HSG and it showed some spillage of dye, so I can say it's partially open. I've taken a bunch of supplements and herbs. Here are my questions. Um, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for, um, a man who has infertility problems. Oh, you guys, I just skipped to another question. So, um, she wanted my opinion on which option she thinks I may benefit from since there's a partial opening. Okay. So this is the thing. You're 43 years old. So let's talk about your AMH. Your AMH level is probably low because that's, what's normal at 43. It's, it's not normal to have like a super high egg count. So anyone who's like shamed, like when you're 43 and you go to the fertility doctor and they're like, well, your egg count's low guess what? Like that's what it's supposed to be. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. But at the end of the day, it's a tool that we use to guide us as far as our chances of pregnancy through IVF. So if at 43, your AMH is let's say 0.3, it may not be worthwhile to move forward with the cycle because your chances are going to be less than 5%. However, if your AMH is over 1.0, your chances might be higher. And you guys remember what I said, ask yourself that question. If in five years from now, you're going to wish that you had tried one more time, do try. But you gave me a puzzle piece. You told me that that tube is partially open. That tube could be messing up our chances, messing them up because that tube could be increasing your risk of an ectopic pregnancy and whatever's in that tube that's partially open, that fluid could be swimming inside, not necessarily swimming, the fluid's not swimming, but the uterus and that tube are, con you know, they're connected. So if that tube is funky, that stuff in that tube could make that embryo um, have a lower rate of implantation and you're still at risk for another ectopic. So anytime I have a patient with that kind of history, I really worry that after an IVF embryo transfer, they're at higher risk of an ectopic pregnancy. So I would consider this, get your levels checked again, consider embryo creation, think about embry embryo transfer preparation. If you're so lucky to get a healthy embryo, think about removing that fallopian tube to completely take away your chance of having a third ectopic pregnancy and then transfer. And then consider other family building, creative family options, 
like egg donation, embryo donation. So you can carry a pregnancy if that's what you want to do. And then I would still definitely think about embryo transfer preparation first and consider removing that tube so you don't end up with an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so now for the next question. Dr. Amy, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for a male who's going through infertility problems. My fiance had cancer as a teenager and a whole slew of problems afterwards, and no one takes us seriously because we're so young. We're under the age of 25. Okay, you guys, if you're young, like it's so important that people take you seriously. It really is. I mean, I take everyone seriously, but my young patients, because I know no one's taking them seriously because they're like, oh, you're so young, everything's gonna be fine. And it's like, no, like if you're young and this stuff's like happening, you gotta be taken seriously and get your levels checked, obviously. There's a really easy sperm test you can do. Um, uh, meetfellow.com backslash egg whisperer. I think that's the code. Um, you can order a sperm test. They'll ship it to your house and then you ship the sperm back and let's find out. Let's find out what's going on with the sperm. Because if he has sperm, let's freeze some. Consider doing IUIs, consider doing IVF because having cancer and going through that treatment as a child for him could have resulted in him having lower sperm counts right now. And you don't wanna waste your time. You wanna find that stuff out now while you're still young. So my heart breaks for you and I'm sorry that people aren't taking you seriously, but give them hell and you are resilient. I know, how annoying is that that I keep showing that? I hope it's not annoying, but it's so true. You guys are all resilient. Here's another question. Dr. Amy, thank you for everything you do. You've been such a support system through my two-year IVF journey. I'm heading into my third FET of a PGT-tested embryo. One ended in chemical and one didn't take. I've done ERA, hysteroscopy, sonohistogram, but I'm wondering if there's anything I can do in terms of lifestyle choices to increase my chances. Thank you again. Okay, guys, this is what you should do implantation rate per embryo, find out what it is. Do another cycle sooner than later because you might need more embryos to have more kids given the number of embryo transfers you've done for the family side, uh, embryo transfers you've done so far to not be successful. You might wanna do another fresh IVF cycle now. Don't wait one or two years, do it now. The other thing would be, um, 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 you know what I'm gonna say, Think about endometriosis. Could this be silent endometriosis that's causing the biochemical? Could it be a hydrosalpings causing the biochemical and the negative pregnancy test? It sounds like you've already done a hysteroscopy sonohistogram, but I didn't see the HSG. This would be a great time to do the HSG, a good time to do the receptiva test. If your doctor doesn't believe in it, don't worry. Just treat things empirically. Sometimes just taking a different approach to your IVF protocol. Consider maybe one month of Depo-Lupron with two tablets per day of Femera, and then you just go right into your estrogen protocol, and then three weeks later, you'll transfer. Just changing things around a little bit, thinking about all the explanations. Even if you don't, don't wanna do more tests or another IVF cycle, that's okay. Chances are this isn't about your lifestyle. If you want to talk about lifestyle, certainly making sure your BMI is under 30, you have a good vitamin D level, your thyroid's normal, you're exercising most days of the week, you're eating a plant-based diet. Like I could go on and on about stress reduction, drinking water and, you know, connecting to others and just listening to electronic dance music in your spare time. <laughs> I threw that in there just to see if you guys were still watching and listening and it sounds like you are, but that's what I do listen to electronic dance music. You would think that I would listen to the chill station and be like, I'm going to be Zen now, but no, it's actually the opposite. It's the inch, inch, inch it that keeps me calm. <laughs> that didn't rhyme. I was hoping that I would say something that rhymed. Okay. Here's another question. Hello, Dr. Amy. I need your help, please. I've had three failed transfers. First one ended in a six-week blighted ovum. The second and third were negative. I started bleeding on the seventh day after transfer. All three transfers were unmedicated transfers. My doctor thinks I'm a good candidate for it. I have this history of an infected fallopian tube. I've done three laparoscopic surgeries before I started IVF. My fallopian tubes are completely removed after I was placed on antibiotics for six months to treat the TB in my tubes before we started IVF. I've only done one stimulation, which yielded seven PGT normal embryos. I'm 27 years old. My endometrium is always great before the transfer over eight. My question is, what is wrong? I've cried my eyes out. I don't know. What can we do for the fourth transfer, please? I didn't purposely put these questions back to back. When I get your questions, I just cut and paste, put them in a document. I print them out about two seconds before I go live and I start reading them. So my answer to this is pretty similar to my last answer. Obviously we know your tubes are disconnected from your uterus, A plus, 
Now we want to talk about doing a completely different protocol. Obviously, we know inflammation is the story and infection from the tuberculosis and how it messed up your fallopian tubes and why we're here in the first place. And we can't forget that. So it's so important. Let's talk about anti-inflammatory diet, anti-inflammatory protocol. And if your doctor doesn't have answers for you as far as what protocol to use, email me. I'll send you a study and your doctor can follow that protocol. And you guys can talk about, obviously, your doctor's not going to follow it just because you emailed me. But there are so many different ways of doing things, and it sounds like it's time to start thinking outside the box and not do the standard transfer protocol and think about things a little bit differently. Certainly, there are other tests that you can do as well, but it does sound like your doctor's been very thorough, your lining is beautiful, and you've done genetic testing, so you've done all the work. You're super resilient, you're super strong, and you're going to get through this, and thinking about a slightly different protocol for this next transfer I think is so worth it, okay? Keep going. Next question. Hello, I'm 39 and have an AMH of 0.5. I don't respond well to IVF meds. My first attempted cycle follicle count of nine, only two grew. I did 300 gonal and 150 of menopure. What protocol should I do? That rhymes. My first attempted cycle, only two grew. What protocol should I do? Okay, I can answer that. So the answer is this. Repeat your AMH. That doesn't make sense. Your AMH is 0.5. You have nine follicles and only two grew. Let's figure this out. Were you on birth control pills? Cut that stuff out. You guys know that. If your AMH is low, you every single egg matters, especially when you're 39. So talk to your doctor to see if that's an option for you. Consider a natural cycle start. Consider a more mini IVF approach. Not because you want to get less eggs, because less eggs is not more unless you have less, then less is more, because then... Um, I, I, you know what I'm saying? I'm just going round and round. But my point is that that hybrid approach that I mentioned earlier on today's show, where you take five days of Femera and then add in the injectables based on the dose that your doctor thinks is right for you and your ovaries is a great way of potentially getting more than two eggs. The reason why I say repeat your AMH is because if your AMH is really below 0.5, then two eggs is awesome. I've had so many beautiful pregnancies from women who only have one egg, believe it or not, one follicle, one egg, one baby. It doesn't happen every time. And it's really scary and emotional to go through a cycle like that. But if your AMH is 0.2 and there's two follicles, there's no reason to cancel your cycle. You would just celebrate the fact that you still have two eggs and go for it. For it and see what you can do to maximize your chances and do embryo banking and freeze enough embryos for your future family and then think about other creative family building options if needed. I make it sound so easy. I know it's not easy. This is so emotional. And for my patients, I try to tell them, let's think of this as work. Obviously, my work is very emotional. Think of it as just like you're going through the motions. You're going to remove the emotion out of it. You're just going to do what you can do while keeping yourself sane the entire time. Again, easier said than done. Last question, and I'm going to get to your chatty questions next. How many embryos should I bank? I want two kids. I have none. My ovarian supply is low. My AMH is 0.5. I would say if you want two kids, depends on the quality of the embryos, but potentially consider having double the number of embryos if your egg count is low. Have four embryos frozen for yourself. And the reason is if one embryo doesn't work in the future, the chances of you getting more eggs at that time sounds like it'll be pretty low if let's say in two to three years, your AMH level is gonna be, let's say like 0.1 or two. So that's why it might be a good idea to freeze more embryos now. Okay, let's go to the chatted questions. Any advice to raise sperm counts and improve morphology? Yes. Tushy method, uh, no, not Tushy method, <laughs> Ball's method. So look at background genetics, do the sperm DNA fragmentation test. If it's high, try and improve it through lifestyle, supplements, get checked for a varicocele, um, uh, labs, look at testosterone. If it's low, consider medications like Clomid and Arimidex, even HCG shots for guys and lifestyle for him. No hot tubs, no saunas, no alcohol. I know it sounds really strict, but come on, two and a half months of their life, no alcohol so that you can have a better outcome, it might be worth it. And he doesn't have to abstain completely, but just moderate alcohol, no THC. And supplements can be like CoQ10. There's so many different supplements out there, um, like Conception XR, Alpha Sperm uh, as well. We have some great chatty questions and I'm gonna start taking them right now. I'm young with a high AMH and starting IVF this week. I'm worried about OHSS and I voiced it to my doctor and he says it happens rarely. It doesn't happen rarely. Any advice? I think what you're saying is it happens rarely. So here's my advice for OHSS. Get seen early and often. So get started at a small dose. Make sure that the dose is appropriate for your body size and the number of follicles. And just make sure you've asked the question, is this dose too much for me? And ask them, what are you going to do to make sure that I stay safe? And write it down. Say, I'd like to write it down. Can you show me and tell me what you're going to do? This is what I do for my patients. Other thing is trigger shot. For the trigger shot, you can use Lupron as a trigger. 
It has a much lower risk of having OHSS. You can use low dose HCG and you can use a combination of the two. And there are a couple other tricks that we use to prevent severe OHSS. The other tricks are bromocryptine. I have my patients, especially if they're at higher risk for moderate to severe, you place one tablet, 2.5 milligrams vaginally every night starting the night of the trigger until your period starts. Femera, also known as letrozole, 2.5 milligrams, starting one pill by mouth every single night for about five nights. And then Ganarelix, yes, you heard it. You can keep taking Ganarelix after your egg retrieval. Obviously, this is for people who are not gonna transfer fresh. If you're gonna transfer fresh and you're at risk, obviously reconsider that and transfer frozen. But this is for people who are gonna transfer frozen, get your body back to normal. And that's another way to prevent OHSS. And then get your body ready and move on with your frozen embryo transfer. And there are IV fluids. We use Hespan. IV albumin is something that some people use and whey protein, W-H-E-Y protein. I think it's something like 60 grams per day. Um, I have my patients start whey protein way before their egg retrieval and even after their egg retrieval. And that seems to work really well to prevent severe OHSS. And also, even if you're at risk for severe OHSS, even if it's mild, even if you're bloated, these tips as far as hydration with like drip drop, um, salty drinks, salty foods. And, uh, you know, I have my patients are like, why do you keep telling me to drink, drink and drink? And I'm like, I know it sounds like we're sorority sisters. <laughs> if you know me and you were my sorority sister, you know that I did not drink. I was always the designated driver because I was such a nerd. And all I wanted to do was be a doctor, big surprise and big surprise too. All I wanted to do was be a fertility doctor. Okay, here's another question. Dr. Amy, I have a question about exercise during IVF stimulation medication. Is it better to do some exercise during the process or try to avoid it? Thanks. Okay, when it comes to exercise, my recommendations are individualized. I tell all my patients, you can exercise until I tell you you can't, right? Because I talk to all my patients. I do all my own ultrasounds, believe it or not. I do most of my blood draws. I do all my own egg retrievals and I do all my own embryo transfers. That's how I would want to go through the IVF experience if it were me, and that's what I do for my patients. I wouldn't wanna meet someone for the first time during one of the most important procedures of my life, and that is an egg retrieval or a transfer. It's just my thing. But I know that there are wonderful centers who do it different ways, and that's totally okay. It's just not how I do it. My point is this, because I'm seeing you, I'm looking at your ovaries, I can actually tell you, stop exercising, or I can tell you, keep exercising, or I can tell you, it's time to slow down. So, I mean, it's important to talk to your doctor in the moment and say, can I keep exercising so they can give you their best recommendations. But for the most part, there's no reason to stop. I feel like as women, we're like, we're made to feel like as soon as you're ready to try to have a baby and get pregnant, all of a sudden you have to just like stop moving and, and not exercise. And it's like, no, that's, there's, there couldn't be anything further from the truth. Keep moving, keep doing all the things that you love to do, except smoking crack. <laughs> just wondering if you guys are still there. That was supposed to be funny. Hi, okay. I'm 29 and on Nexplanon. Modern fertility AMH was 1.89. Is that low? My gyno said it's normal and don't worry and I'm worried. Yeah, at 29, an AMH of 1.89 is fine. There's nothing wrong with a 1.89. If you were to think about it in IVF, like in an IVF type of analogy, I would say I'd probably get about 15 eggs from you. And at 29, that's awesome. Most of your eggs would probably be genetically normal. So the thing is the Nexplanon could be suppressing your AMH as well. So I'm not sweating it at all. But the thing is that if you're going to start having kids when you're, let's say, over 33, 34, and you want two kids, you might have wished that you had frozen your eggs. And I don't think everyone needs to freeze their eggs. I think everyone needs to learn about egg freezing. Everyone needs to learn about their fertility. Everyone needs to track and trend their levels so that you're not like sitting there annoyed, like, why didn't I know this five years ago? So no, your AMH is just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But think about how many kids you want. When are you going to have them? And... Uh, and then repeat your levels and then get seen by a fertility doctor, get your ovaries looked at, you know, get an antral follicle count done and then have them kind of guide you as far as what your chances are at your age. If you were to freeze your eggs now versus freeze your eggs in like five years, and then you can make a decision that's best for you. But I can tell you all my patients who are listening right now, who are 40 and they're listening to this and seeing that there's a 29 year old asking this question, I imagine like you can't hear their voices right now, but I can hear they're like, freeze your eggs. Like they're screaming at the top of their lungs. I would have wished someone had told me to freeze them. I wish I was as smart as you were when I was 29. But the reality is you can wait a few years at 32. I don't think that there's gonna be that much of a difference between 29 and 32. And if you guys know me, you know what I'm gonna say last, take your CoQ10, take CoQ10. 
take CoQ10. It can potentially help with your egg quality. I think we're going to learn more, especially because I've been saying take CoQ10 for years now, that women who take it earlier might have better fertility later. Okay, so Theralogix, it's phonetic. Use the PRC code TUSHY, capital T-U-S-H-Y for the discount code. They have a preconception vitamin called uh, Ovavite and it has CoQ10 in it, or you can just get their NeoQ10, one to two capsules per day of the NeoQ10. Next question, advice for secondary infertility, clean HSG, healthy sperm, healthy ovulation. So when it comes to secondary infertility, what I tell people is we don't age backwards. The older we are, the harder it is to get pregnant. So there's no such thing as unexplained. You always have to wonder if it's related to your egg quality. So if you're 37 years old, consider going right to IVF. Don't take your eggs and your youth for granted. You're 37. You're so young. You're like way younger than I am. <laughs> I digress. Um, and then look at sperm DNA fragmentation. Look at the sperm morphology. Don't let anyone sugarcoat that sperm. And then both of you should get in the best shape of your lives. There's no better time than now. I had a great guest, Dr. Sneha Kishore, talk about lifestyle medicine and what she does to help her patients and clients stay healthy. And the things that she talks about are the exact same things that I talk about when it comes to improving egg and sperm. So these things are just good for our lives. They can help with egg quality. And the other thing when it comes to unexplained, and you can see like my eyes are rolling in my head because I hate that term, Think about endometriosis. Is this silent endometriosis? Are we missing adenomyosis? Because if we are, we don't want to waste time. We want to try and get pregnant and have you consider being a little bit more aggressive than maybe you wouldn't be had you not had endometriosis. I hope that makes sense. I see the hearts. I love the hearts. Thank you. Okay, here's another question. During the entire IVF process, is it okay to take CoQ10 every day or is there a better period we'd better stop taking it? So for my patients, I have you take it every day up until the egg retrieval and beyond. I even have patients take it through their embryo transfer. Just because I said that doesn't mean your doctor will recommend that as well. So talk to your doctor about it. But I think it has anti-inflammatory properties that can help not just with getting pregnant, but staying pregnant as well for some people. Next question. Do I need to be considered with uterus adhesions? I had a polyp removed last year and now need surgery to remove it. Doing IVF round number five in October. I get it. So what you're saying is you had a polyp removed and you want to know, should you be worried about adhesions? The answer is I'm not so worried about adhesions. Removing polyps is super fun and super easy. I'm worried about recurrent polyps right? So if you're doing IVF round in October and you had your polyp removed, I imagine it's going to probably be three to six months since you had your polyp removed before you transfer again, let's say in November, December. So I would suggest doing a repeat hysteroscopy, HSG or something like that to evaluate the cavity and see if there's another polyp there before you transfer. So I think it's a good idea to think about the uterine cavity again. Here's another question. Is seeing a yolk sac at five and a half weeks a good sign or can you still have a blighted ovum? I hate the word blighted ovum. It's so annoying. But the thing is this, it basically means a sac with nothing inside. If you have a sac with the yolk, yolk sac inside, by definition, it is a clinical pregnancy at five and a half weeks. That's kind of what we expect to see. That would not be considered a blighted ovum. Here's another question. I have hypothalamic amenorrhea. How does this impede pregnancy if you respond really well to menopure growing two eggs and a 12 millimeter lining? Wonder if there's anything hurting my chances. So hypothalamic amenorrhea, for those of you guys who don't know, is basically considered as like exercise induced prevention of ovulation. I mean, it's not like that for everybody, but basically it think of it as like, you know, the gymnasts when they are doing gymnastics and then they're super fit and they stop having their periods. So their brains are like, oh my God, there's something like happening, I'm not going to send signals to my ovary. That's basically what hypothalamic amenorrhea is. So if you fixed it and you're taking Menopure and you're ovulating two eggs and you have this gorgeous lining, something else is happening. Think about this though. If you don't ovulate at all, give it six cycles. I know that sounds insane. Most of the time it should work within three, but if it doesn't, obviously we have to make sure that we've done the tushy check, right? Tubes. We already know your uterus is fine. Sperm, look at all your hormones, thyroid, prolactin, vitamin D, and then your genetics. Make sure you've done enough genetic testing. I can't tell you that enough. I've seen so many heartbreaking patient stories and heard them of patients who find out too late that there was a chromosome issue and they wish they had done IVF when, you know, at the start of their journey and not wasted so much time doing treatments that would have never worked for them. So that's why I just say that, just because of my own experience with patients who are young and have situations like this. So in general, it sounds like you're in great position and have a really great chance of pregnancy. So keep trying. It doesn't sound like you're missing anything big picture, but always reevaluate. Always ask your doctor when a treatment doesn't work. Why do you think this doesn't, didn't, why didn't you, <laughs> let me try that again. Why do you think this didn't work for me? Is there anything that you would do differently in the next cycle? What can I do to improve my chances of a better outcome? Three questions. Three.
Okay. Next question. Is NAC suitable for anybody? Uh, everyone. Um, I don't know that everyone needs NAC. And acetylcysteine is something that's been shown to uh, actually shrink endometriosis. Who would have thought that that could actually be a thing? And yes, it has shown that. NAC has also been found to maybe reduce or help glucose homeostasis in patients with PCOS. Again, like that's wild. And then on top of that, it might help with egg quality. Hmm. So it's like, should everyone be taking it? I don't know that everyone needs it, but should a lot of people be taking it? I would say yes. That's why I recommend it a lot when I talk about supplements and what people want to do. Here's another question. My doctor wants to add Lupron to five milligrams of letrozole for my next IUI. My previous IUIs, I responded to letrozole, but did not conceive. What are your thoughts on adding Lupron for IUI? Hmm, I'm thinking maybe your doctor meant gonal F or Folistim. We typically don't add Lupron, um, maybe trigger with Lupron if you had a wild explosion happening and they didn't want to give you HCG, but I do like to do a hybrid protocol of Femera, Femera with Menopure, Gonal F, or Folistim, something like that. And typically if I'm going to add injections, I'm not going to keep to just two tablets of Femera. I use even three, four, and believe it or not, even five. Five tablets of Femera, I've used it before. I've even done it for 10 days before in patients who have clomid resistant or Femera resistant PCOS. It does actually, I've seen it work before. Okay, let's keep going here. Have you heard of being super fertile and it causing recurrent miscarriage and any suggestion to fix this? I have, and that's like the most annoying thing ever when you have recurrent miscarriages and people are like, you're so fertile. It's like, that is so annoying because it's so frustrating. It almost takes, makes you feel like that pain that you've experienced should be somehow like not painful because you're supposedly getting pregnant all the time. There's actually nothing more painful than that. There's nothing more painful than going through a miscarriage in this lifetime. Nothing. There are few things that come close to dealing with that. When I tell a woman that she's pregnant, I know in that moment I told her that she is going to become a mother. And when that pregnancy stops, I know that she has been dreaming and hoping and seeing all the milestones that are in her future. And that joy is now gone. So that's actually why I do what I do, you guys. That's why I'm here is I went into fertility medicine to help people who have miscarriages. And of course, not to make a joke, but of course I've come up with a, a strategy and I call it the angel method. So in women who've had miscarriages, it shouldn't be confusing. It shouldn't be hard for doctors to figure out what tests you need. The angel method is a very simple approach to recurrent miscarriage care. Age, anatomy, AMH, autoimmune conditions. Those are the A's, super important to check. The N is nutrition. Make sure that your nutrition is top notch. G, genetics. Chromosome analysis, look at sperm DNA fragmentation, look at a carrier screen, make sure you're not missing anything. E is for endocrine disorders, look at thyroid, diabetes. And the L is for lifestyle. Body size, medications you and your partner could potentially be taking that could be causing miscarriages, believe you or not. Believe me, there are some. And uh, THC, smoking, those are the things in the lifestyle. So thank you for asking that question. I definitely empathize with you. And I, and I hope that your next pregnancy is going to be amazing and give you everything that you want and keep asking questions. Those are my suggestions to fix it. If you guys didn't notice. Okay. I've already been on birth control for three weeks and my AMH is 0.4. Would you recommend canceling the cycle and starting again without birth control? So I would make that decision with your doctor. I would go in and look at your follicle count. If your follicle count isn't four or more, I would suggest doing that. You want to go in and do IVF once and be like one and done. You don't want to do it once and be like, ah, oh, we have to cancel this cycle and wait another one or wait for another one. So when I make my decision to do a cycle, I'm tracking and trending levels. I'm looking at the follicle count. People are coming in, we're talking, we're saying, based on my experience with you and your ovaries, is this the best cycle for us to move forward with? Or should we wait one more month? Sometimes we say, wait one more month. And I don't think of it as like failure or canceling. I think of it as we're just waiting for something amazing to come. And a lot of times when you do that, you're really happy you did that. And sometimes you look back and say, well, it's the same thing as what it was last month. We're still going to go ahead. Next question. Is dark brown spotting and mild cramping at six and a half weeks? Okay. If you were my patient and you had spotting and mild cramping, I would say, listen, I'm here. Come on in. Let's take a look and see what's going on. Make sure that if you're Rh negative, if it is actually red blood, 
get your Rogam shot. I would talk to you about the amount of progesterone you're on and see how things are going. I also check a progesterone level, but in general, that's a pretty normal common sign in pregnancy. I'm just sharing you some of the things that I do with my patients. For my upcoming FET, my doctor suggested Lupron trigger only without any HCG. And she said, I don't need HCG for the FET. In your opinion, will Lupron only affect the egg quality? So for the FET, I personally don't do Lupron trigger. I'm just going to leave it there. There are a lot of reasons why I don't. HCG can mimic progesterone. It can make your progesterone levels rise. It also helps induce the maturation of the egg. There's so many benefits to it. I would say keep asking questions about why they're using the Lupron trigger as part of your natural cycle FET. Sometimes we use Lupron in different ways, not to trigger. So maybe there's a misunderstanding or miscommunication, not that you're not hearing it well, but maybe someone's not communicating the right name of the drug that you'll be using. You're right to ask that question. Something doesn't quite make sense there. Hi, Dr. A, age is 43, sperm DFI 32%, Tessie, Tessie used 16 eggs, fertilized only one 4cc blast. What happened? 22. Two, uh, 225 of gonal F, 150 menopure, 25 omnitrope, dual trigger and estrus priming suggestions. Okay, this is the thing. At 43, that's a totally normal cycle. I mean, it sucks, but that's the reality. I tell my patients who are 43, it might take four to six cycles to even get one embryo if we're able to get it. So I know you did so much work. It sounds like your protocol was fine. It sounds like your husband went through clearly a lot, but I would say it's just out of our control. If you were my patient, I would say consider doing a fresh aspiration of sperm with your eggs. Consider doing, I know this is hard to hear for your husband, but consider using donor sperm. I think as women, we're made to feel like it's either egg donor or nothing. And I feel like we don't have enough people saying, consider a sperm donor, because obviously you used aspirated sperm. There's obviously a sperm issue. So why aren't we just talking about that? Give yourself a chance of pregnancy with your own eggs and use a sperm donor instead of using his sperm, <coughs> excuse me, and using an egg donor. So those are some of the strategies I'd have you talk to your doctor about. Consider another aspiration of sperm fresh with your eggs. Consider Zymote too. Not every clinic will use it. Some people will say they don't believe in it and that's okay. You wanna to go to a clinic that believes in it because they've used it and they've seen amazing results from it. I certainly have. So in a case like yours, if you don't wanna do a fresh aspiration, you can use a Zymote chip and still achieve the goals that you want. And sometimes they've even been a little bit more creative. Zymote and Pixie, run it through Pixie, uh, run it through Zymo, Pixie it, Ixie it. <laughs> that sounded like a wrap. Okay. What's the typical time frame for an FET with PGT after retrieval? I had a retrieval or I have a retrieval September 9th and wondering what my month two will be looking to do my transfer. Okay, you guys, so you know I have what I call the egg whisper diet. And no, it's not a recipe. It just is not. It's basically diagnosis, IVF, embryo transfer preparation or endometrial testing and transfer, D-I-E-T, right? So you have to know your diagnosis before you do all that stuff. So IVF, think of it as stage one or step one, month one, embryo transfer preparation, month two, embryo transfer month three. We skip month two if we are so lucky and we have a ton of embryos and we want to skip the ERA test. Otherwise, the way I think about it is this. Egg retrieval period starts two weeks later, transfer three weeks later, okay? Five weeks after your egg retrieval, you can do a frozen embryo transfer. However, if you choose to do implantation testing, think of it like this. Two weeks after the egg retrieval period starts, three weeks later, you do your implantation testing, period starts. Three weeks after that, you do your transfer. So it's about eight weeks. Eight weeks from the egg retrieval, if you're going to do implantation testing, approximately, you will have your transfer. I know that seems like forever, but doing a transfer that doesn't work, <laughs> doing a transfer that doesn't work feels like forever as well. Okay. So that's why I do this stuff to help you guys remember what questions to ask. Here's another question. Does increase in HCG or progesterone cause sore boobs in the first trimester? I would say it's both. All the hormones cause your boobs to be sore. Okay, is melatonin helpful for egg quality for IVF? Of my 16 eggs retrieved and fertilized, nine made it to blast, seven were sent off to PGS, and one came back normal. First of all, I'm sorry that it was only one, but I think of it as, yes, it was one, because I can tell you, if I was your doctor and I gave you that news, I'd be like, oh my God, thank God there was one. We are still making normal blasts, so go do it again. It sounds like you are. And yes, I think having good sleep is really important. I think that's part of the reason why melatonin might help. It's also a potent antioxidant. Studies have shown melatonin with things like ovocetol, that's brand name, but inositol, myo-inositol, together, they might potentiate each other's effects 
and result in better quality eggs. So talk to your doctor if they think that that might be something that you would do for you or they would recommend for you, but certainly that's something that I do recommend and talk to my patients about. We talk about melatonin all the time around here. Three milligrams per night, I recommend getting it in one milligram tablet. So if you take three and you're feeling kind of wonky the next day, you can go down to two or go down to one. We don't know if one's better than two is better than three. I don't think you need five to 10, but some people take more. Okay, let's see if there are any more questions. Not sure if my question trans transferred over from the previous live chat. Fourth frozen embryo transfer cycle, getting ready for my ERA biopsy. Then my doctor mentions testing for endometriosis or adenomyosis. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are, yes, check for it. Of course, I think so much of unexplained is silent endometriosis, you guys. I can't even begin to tell you with the plastics that we're being exposed to, all the junk that's in the food and then the water, the, the all the endocrine disruptors that are out there. It's no wonder that I think that not I think, it's no wonder that silent endometriosis rates are probably higher than ever right now. And so I think it is really important to check for endometriosis. And so I totally agree with what your doctor is doing. So when I do the ERA test, it's one biopsy, two tests. And then in the future, I'm sure it's gonna be like three or four tests, but I do the receptiva test with the ERA test. They get sent off in two little vials and then I get results back and then we make plans when your period starts and we talk about protocol and timing. And we ask ourselves the question, do we have all the embryos for the family size that you want? Do we have all the information we need so that if we transfer, we don't look back and say, huh, we probably should have done that first. We don't do any second guessing. Remember, we don't roll embryos, we roll dice. You heard that here first, you guys. That's gonna be a t-shirt that I'm gonna get made. You don't roll embryos, you roll dice. But I swear to God, I feel like sometimes it feels like we're rolling embryos and I don't want you guys to do that. Okay, next question. Has anyone taken the risk to transfer an abnormal embryo? Of course, we do it all the time. That's what a fresh embryo transfer is called. But don't do it. I mean, ask your doctor, is there a chance this embryo could be mosaic? The likelihood that an abnormal embryo is actually normal is 1% or less. So 99 point, like, I don't know what percent of abnormal embryos are really abnormal unless it's mosaic. So do a post test consult with the genetic testing company that you use and talk to them about it. Say, do you guys check for mosaicism? I bought big diamond earrings. They're totally fake. And I was going to wear them for today's show to remind you guys about embryo diamonds. Diamonds, you guys, that's the mnemonic for everything you need to know about your embryos. What day they were frozen, the implantation rate, are they abnormal? Are they mosaic? Get the official reports, make sure you have a copy of it, your genetic testing report and your embryology report. Are they normal? Will they help you reach your dreams? And let's talk about sex, no, I'm kidding, I didn't say that. Um, sperm, what was the quality of the sperm? Was there something that you need to know about it on the day of the egg retrieval? That's the important stuff. And I just threw in sex because just wanted to see if you guys are listening and it looks like you are. Next question, we've been TTCing that sounds kinky, um, for 16 months. All tushy tests done thanks to you, thank you for that, are normal. We're considering IVF. Are there any other tests we should have done other than the DNA fragmentation when we are 33? Yes, I would consider doing a chromosome analysis and then um, it seems like maybe talk to your doctor about the three-step approach. Step one, you guys know it, IVF with PGTA. Step two, do the implantation testing. Step three, and transfer, you can skip the implantation testing. I feel like I'm controlling traffic here. Um, skip the implantation testing if you have like a ton more embryos than the number of kids that you want. And I wish you all the best and you're awesome. And again, all my 40 year old patients are like, you suck and I'm kidding. They're saying like, you're freaking amazing. You're 33 and you're taking this step. Go for it and we're, we're rooting for you. Okay, here's another question. Is it normal to have started on a short protocol and as a fresh transfer could not go ahead and move on to a long protocol for a frozen embryo transfer? Short, long, yeah. I mean, the, the, we really are just doing the same thing in different ways. I mean, short versus long, basically you're suppressing ovulation with Lupron versus not. That's probably what you mean, or starting with birth control pills and for a frozen embryo transfer, it really doesn't matter so much. I mean, the rules are basically this. Once your lining gets to about eight millimeters or greater and your hormone levels are where your doctor wants them to be, you can be on estrogen for not an unlimited amount of time, but usually we don't like people to be on like, a month and a half of estrogen before they start the progesterone and then progesterone starts the clock. So 
I have no problems with what you're sharing. Okay, here's another question. Can I take levothyroxine with fertility medication? The answer is yes. We definitely want you to continue your thyroid medication while you're taking fertility drugs. Fertility medication can affect your thyroid metabolism. Pregnancy can affect your thyroid metabolism. Metabolism. So it is super important to keep taking your thyroid meds and monitor your thyroid levels in pregnancy and during fertility treatment as well, especially right before your frozen embryo transfer. So if you're a patient of mine, when we're doing a frozen embryo transfer, I will check your TSH at your lining check if I haven't checked it sooner. Okay. Can you PGT test an embryo after it's already been frozen as a day five blast? Great question. The answer is yes, but talk to your doctor first. If they don't like to do it in their lab because it doesn't work out well for them, don't ask them to do it. Typically, if an embryo is already hatched out, for example, it's like a 6BB, we don't re thaw and biopsy that embryo. It just depends on how expanded. Now, think of an embryo like a little popcorn kernel. Think of how much little pop. <laughs> what is the white? Can someone tell me what is the white of a popcorn? Is it popcorn? I mean, it's the kernel and then there's the popcorn. So I guess depending on how much popcorn <laughs> has popped out, that kind of tells you whether that embryo can have the biopsy done or not. So ask your doctor and the answer is most of the Bay Area and here in the San Francisco area can do thaw biopsy refreeze, but talk to your doctor about the statistics for doing that in their lab and whether they recommend it or not. Because we don't want to ask people to do things that they're not comfortable doing because that's just not fair. And they know they're, it's like if you're in the restaurant business, you know your kitchen better than anyone else. You don't want someone coming in and telling you what to do in your restaurant and how to do it because that's just awkward. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, how do elevated prolactin levels affect fertility? Mine are slightly elevated, last two blood tests at 80 and trying to conceive for two years. So uh, prolactin can affect how you ovulate. It can affect the signals of your brain to your ovary and how they induce ovulation. They can affect your progesterone levels. They can also affect implantation by affecting certain receptors inside your lining. So the answer is, it can affect your fertility. Talk to someone about doing an MRA of your brain to look for a pituitary adenoma if they haven't done that already and talk to them about getting treated. There's certain drugs or there's really simple shape medications that have been around forever that can help and also get your thyroid level checked and see if you're taking a medication like an antidepressant. There's so many medications that can cause high prolactin too and see if maybe that's the culprit and stop that medication. Next question. At 39, should I wait to be on CoQ10 and Ovocidol for a full three months before I try IUI? And the answer is no. You can do it all at the same time. You don't need three months of supplements, guys. That's sperm talk. Egg talk is just start and just move forward with treatment, especially if you're 39. Don't wait three months. That's just a way for people to sell things like three months of antioxidants or three months of acupuncture treatment. The best acupuncturists will tell you not to wait. And uh, it makes me mad when people say, oh, I have to wait three months and I'm 43 years old because I need that CoQ10 to kick in. I'm like, huh? Huh? Like, did you not know that all the eggs that you have, you were born with? Like, this doesn't work that way. Next question, FSH7, LH5, prolactin 10, TSH 2.4, AMH 2.6. I have Hashimoto's sperm above average, had surgery to remove uterine polyps. What next? Was on birth control pre pills pre-surgery, worried it might mess us up. So if your AMH is 2.6, Depending on your age, consider doing IUIs. You don't necessarily need the IUI, but consider maybe ovulation induction if you haven't gotten pregnant after three months. So if you were a patient of mine and I removed polyps from you and you're under the age of 35, I would say, listen, try and get pregnant at home. And if you're having a hard time, don't worry about it. We'll take it out of the bedroom. I can give you some fertility pills like Femera to help you ovulate a couple of eggs. And then we can do IUI in the office. And if you're not pregnant within two to three months, then we can do IVF or sooner, depending on how many kids you want. So that's kind of how I think through that question. When I see my ovulation test peak, is it best to have sex on the peak days? No, the answer is it's best to have sex leading up to the peak days. No one wants saved up sperm. Your egg doesn't either. We like fresh, we like sperm that sparkle. <laughs> if you're a patient of mine, we talk about sparkling sperm all the time. It's true. It's a little awkward, but <laughs> maybe for the sperm, we have fun here. Next question. I asked my doctor to freeze my eggs, but because we came as a couple, my doctor discouraged this, very annoying. Should I bring this up again? I don't know why that would be um, discouraged. Um, so I have patients who are coupled and they choose to freeze eggs because number one, they don't wanna deal with having leftover embryos, so it makes perfect sense for them. Um, number two, they're actually not sure they want to have kids in some situations. Number three, um, they may not need those eggs and they just started their fertility journey and they wanna try naturally and maybe less aggressive things. So there are a lot of reasons why a couple might not want to make embryos and that's totally okay. Just tell them like, I'd like to freeze eggs. You, that, that's totally fine. Next question. I'm mostly a vegetarian, but eat some seafood during the IVF process for a better 
outcome of a quality and ever transfer, should I also start to eat other meat? And the answer is no, you do not need to have meat. Meat does not improve your egg quality. It does not. There's so many great ways of getting protein from plants. Broccoli. Yes, people, you heard it here first. If you didn't know it already, broccoli, you don't need to eat meat. Okay, let's see this. Is there a way to boost ovulation other than Clomid or Femera? I wish. There really isn't. There. Well, I mean, there's, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, Arimidex. Uh, you can take, an, yeah, Arimidex, Tamoxifen. Those are drugs that can also induce, those are pills that you can take that can also help eggs grow, similar to Femera or Clomid. Next question, can you have a period without ovulating? I've never had a surge. I had to go in repeatedly for blood draws. So the answer is yeah, you can have a period. Uh, so you, oh no, no, I see what you're saying. I'm thinking, can you have an ovulation without a period? And you're saying, can I have a period without ovulating? And the answer is yes. We call that dysfunctional uterine bleeding or DUB or anovulatory bleeding. And you know, when your lining builds up to a certain point, sometimes you can just shed it without having an ovulation two weeks prior. So if that's happening to you, talk to your doctor about doing some basic tests, rule out hypothalamic amenorrhea, rule out PCOS, rule out DOR. Simple tests like the FSH estradiol, it doesn't have to be cycle day three, it can just be random as well as your AMH and look at your thyroid and prolactin. Those could be very simple explanations for what's going on for you. Let's see here. Love that you guys are listening and paying attention. And what are the chances of conception? If sperm morphology is 1% first test, 0% second test, that makes me think no sperm is viable for a natural pregnancy or very little, so the chances must be low. Okay, guys, you know the balls method. Go to ballsmethod.com, no big deal. Figure out why is the sperm morphology low? What can you do that's in your control to improve it? Okay, I won't go through the balls method right now because I've already done it earlier on today's um, Ask the Egg Whisperer live chat Q&A, but all I'll tell you is this. When you go to Costco, I haven't been to Costco for a really long time. You know, the little clicker, click, 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 click. Okay, you're walking in Costco. Every time you walk in, there's a person at the front, click, click, click. Okay, that's what the andrologist is doing. Left click, normal. Right click, abnormal. So every time they see a sperm cell, left click, 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 they get to 100, ding, ding, ding. You get it? They're only looking at 100 sperm cells. They're not looking at all the sperm. So is it possible that every single sperm cell is abnormally shaped? Sure, it's possible. Is it 100%? Probably not. So you still have a chance of having a healthy pregnancy, but get the DNA fragmentation testing, get him done over to a male fertility specialist, get his scrotum squeezed. No, they don't squeeze it. They'll palpate, check for a varicocele, and that's super important, guys. Next question, hello, I'm 43, tried to conceive for six years with a failed IVF, got pregnant naturally, now still nursing my 22 month old. My OB wants me to try Clomid, I'm ovulating with a 24 ish day cycle. Have you? Do you have any advice? Yes. I would say be as aggressive as you feel comfortable being. If you want another baby, you're 43 and you have a 22 month old, first of all, congratulations, awesomeness. But I would say, you know, consider doing exactly what you're doing and um, being as aggressive as possible. Next question, AMH 0.13, 44 years old, six IUIs. It sounds like she's saying that she's pregnant. Well, congratulations, that's amazing. Um, can one bodies get back to normal after four months of monthly Lupron? I'm 36. My values were already not great. Is there a risk that Lupron can push you into early menopause? What can I do to undo Lupron? Yeah, that's a really important conversation to have before you start Lupron is what are your AMH levels before? If you want to do more cycles, do them ahead of time. Don't do them after Lupron. But the good news is, and I've seen this before, your ovaries should wake up. And if they don't, it's because they're, it's not like the Lupron put you into menopause. It was That was already going on with your ovaries. And now you know. It's just called a coincidence. But yeah, that's really annoying if you like find out after four months of Lupron that your egg count, count is low. But I've literally seen someone's AMH after Lupron go from 0.1 to 1.5. True story. True story. So yes, I do think you can wake your ovaries up. If you want to wake them up and freeze eggs and freeze embryos and stuff like that, that is no big deal. You just start the fertility drugs. Being on Lupron is out of your system after 30 days from the last injection. If it's a 3.75 milligram shot, then you can start fertility injections right away. You don't have to wait for a period. And then you can start growing eggs and see what happens. That's probably the best way to undo it. Can you talk more about the hybrid method? What doses of Femera and Menopure start cycle day two? Absolutely, start cycle day two. Use anywhere from three to four tablets of Femera every single night. If it gives you headaches, I have patients take two tablets in the morning, two tablets at night, or taper it throughout the day. So 8 a.m., 2 p.m., 
8 p.m. or 8 noon, 4 and 8 if you have a hard time tolerating it because of headaches, hot flashes or nausea. Menopure just depends on the number of follicles. It depends on my previous experience with you and your ovaries. Sometimes I start it after two nights of the femera. Sometimes I start it after four nights. Sometimes I start it on the fifth night. So everyone's body is different. Everyone's follicles are different, but typically I bring people in after the first night of the menopure and femera combined. And then I take a look at the ovaries and see what we want to do from there, whether I need to add the antagonist to slow things down so I can keep growing them or whether we decide that this is not a great IVF cycle for us, but it's still a great treatment cycle. So if you notice, I never, if you're my patient, I don't talk about cycles that are getting canceled. I talk about things like we're going to do fertility treatment this cycle. We'll wait and see if it's a good IVF cycle or we should do IUI, but it's always a treatment cycle. So that's really important to me to come to think about things in that kind of positive light, because if you're doing IVF and someone said, oh, it's a bad cycle. Oh, it's canceled. I mean, I'd be like, oh God, you're so negative. I don't want that energy around me. So for me, it's, we're going to do a treatment. Okay. It's either going to be IVF or IUI. And we're going to figure it out. Next question, can you do egg retrievals awake? You can, should you? Shh, no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't like to do egg retrievals awake because I sing and you know, no one wants to listen to me singing while I'm doing egg retrievals. I actually totally don't sing. I take my egg retrievals very, very seriously. I have my own routine. I'm like, I have this, like, I won't tell you what my routine is. It's very secret. Um, but I actually do have a routine that I go through every single time I do an egg retrieval. I have a prayer that I say, I have a talk that I do with the patient because it's very important to me that my patients know how important their fertility is and how important their chance for pregnancy is. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I've done them awake before for different reasons, but for the most part, everyone is sound asleep and they wake up right after the egg retrieval because they're under, it's basically like a nap. They just take an IV nap. Next question. Uh, many women have periods, but not ovulating. Uh, can an egg retrieval be done uh, awake? I already, okay. What are your thoughts on the scary stories and effect of double lupron to treat endo? Reading all the stories have made me scared to death. So that's the thing. If someone is scared and they read those stories, I'm like, don't do it then. So I actually, I'm, I'm a Google, I'm, I'm, I'm not Dr. Google. I mean, I'm better than Dr. Google, but I tell my patients to Google it. So I say to my patient, I'm going to recommend this medication for you. I want you to Google it first. I'm going to tell you what the side effects are, but I want you to Google it. And I want you to think about all the worst things that people have talked about that are going to happen to them. And I promise you the likelihood of it happening to you is like less than 1%, but I want you to read about it first because imagine taking the shot and then all of a sudden you've read these stories and then you start thinking that those things are happening to you because you've read them. I think it's so important to read them first. And then if you feel like there's no way I can handle even like one day of depression, and if you're impatient of mine, you have depression and you're on medications, you're, you're not getting Depo-Lupron. You're going to get Orlissa, or we're just going to do Femera every single day for about two to three months. And then we're going to add the estrogen. So there's so many different ways of dealing with endometriosis before a transfer, especially if you have a high BCL-6 or you have known adeno or endometriosis, you don't have to feel that you need to suffer with Depo-Lupron. Believe me, there are a lot of strategies that work really, really well. And your doctor will know what those strategies are and talk to them about it and then think through what all the options are before you transfer. Okay, is an ERA helpful in a natural cycle fat? What are the chances of implantation window being off? The chances are still, you know, I would say depending on what studies you read, maybe 25% chance of being off and I do them in natural cycles as well. I've used four months of Depo-Lupron. Can my body come back to normal? The answer is yes, it can. I've been going through the IVF process. My hysteroscopy result a month ago did not find any problem on my uterus, but my first ultrasound a few days ago showed that I have a small fibroid. May I ask what could be the reason of the situation? Do I need to worry about it for the embryo transfer? So if you have a small fibroid, I tell people it's like having an earring on. That earring, my earring, you see it right there? My earring has nothing to do with my uterus, zero. So most fibroids, if they're like tiny, inside the wall of the uterus, hanging off the uterus, they won't affect your fertility, so don't worry about it. Forget about it. But definitely monitor the growth if it's, let's say, growing, if it's close to five centimeters or larger, if it's within five millimeters of the cavity, you wanna to talk to someone about it and be like, hey, should I think about removing this fibroid and maybe get a second opinion? And if the answer is no, then forget about it. Next question. May I ask what could be the reason of the situation? Oh, I already answered that. Okay. In regards to the birth control concept, my AMH is currently 0.73 and I'm 32. Do you recommend going off birth control since I've been on it for a long time to see if my levels improve? 
I mean, if you're 32 years old and you really want a good idea as to what's going on with your ovarian reserve, yeah, stop it for two months and then check your AMH and see what's going on and then do your FSH and estradiol. Because if you're on birth control pills, knowing what your FSH and estradiol levels on birth control pills doesn't really help because birth control pills suppress your FSH and estradiol level. That's what birth control pills do and that's how they work. So you're going to get a false sense that your FSH is normal. Um, so you don't want that false sense of security. You want to get the facts. You want the truth so that you have a nice roadmap. So you don't look back and be like, why didn't I know this sooner? Okay. Um, I've heard situations where a patient did not fast, then they may have to do it awake. So depending on the anesthesia group that you're working with and the doctor, there are certain medications that you can still take and be very much close to almost asleep. So just lesson there, don't eat or drink the morning of your egg retrieval, including water. That's what I always tell my patients because people think eating or drinking water doesn't count. Water counts. What do you think about luteal phase stem plus omnitrope for DOR? I have an AFC of six and 41. Follicle stem yielded eight eggs, five fertilized, made it to day three, none made it to day six. You know, I'm not a luteal phase stem kind of person. I just have tried it and I haven't been impressed with the results. I've probably done it maybe like less than a dozen times. There are clinics that do a really good job of it. So if someone says, oh, I think you need luteal phase, luteal phase stem, Sounds like they have a lot of experience with it and go for it and see if it'll help. But it's just in my hands, it's not something that I like because I, I don't feel like I have the control that I need because the hormone levels, as you know, are from ovulation. You have high estrogen, high progesterone, and it's like, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. And I feel like my patients really enjoy knowing what's going on with their hormone levels and how many eggs are growing and what follicles ovulating and what's not. Okay, let's see here. Here's another question. Um, um, in the absence of frequent ultrasounds, how do you know things are progressing well in the first trimester? I'm a ball of nerves. It's really hard. So I would say check HCG progesterone levels and ask for frequent ultrasounds. And if they won't give it to you, then I would say maybe HCG progesterone levels is probably the best way to know because there's no physical symptom that will tell you things are going well. And I agree. It's like nerve wracking. Um, let's see here. Will Lupron only affect a call? Okay, let's go. Any, let's go to the next one. Any extra tests I can do to make sure my body's ready for a transfer? I have two PGS normal embers. I've completed a thyroid panel and be getting a saline sauna on ERA receptiva. That sounds perfect. I mean, it sounds like you've done everything that you possibly can with the science that we have available to us. Last transfer was a chemical with a low level mosaic. Well, I love low level mosaics when they, I mean, not that I love them. It's hard to have a low-level mosaic because it can be confusing for so many people, but you can have a beautiful mosaic baby, so to speak. And I'm so glad that you gave that embryo a chance. And I think it's important for people to know that mosaic embryos can be transferred. They might have a lower chance of pregnancy, not might, they do, and a lower chance of having a live birth, but at least you can know that you gave that embryo a chance. And I think that's really important. Um, I have DOR in increased AMH from 0.41 to 0.49. I'm supplementing with DHEA. However, now my progesterone is 3.29 at baseline. My clinic said stop DHEA. I'm worried this will affect future cycles. I mean, my thing is that um, uh, it's just a function of the DHEA that your progesterone is high. It's not, just keep going. I mean, just go with the flow. Your flow is mean your menstrual flow. And we say that a lot around here. I often say go with the flow. And I mean menstrual flow. I know other people don't think of it that way. And I think I'm really being funny when I say that, but I wouldn't let your progesterone level get in the way of starting STEM. And so I would probably, especially if you're dealing with DOR, is encourage your clinic to consider to still move forward. Okay. I didn't get a warm feeling from my clinic where I froze eggs. Is it not advised to move and thaw the eggs at another clinic? So my thing is, if you didn't get a warm feeling, that's okay. I would verbalize it. You can say it to somebody, talk to the doctor, say, I'm just not getting a warm feeling. This is what I'm feeling. Can you help me feel more comfortable about what I'm doing here and see what they say. And if you feel like you just can't go there, it's okay. My suggestion is to request embryo creation. I think moving eggs and thawing them elsewhere is not as secure as having the embryos made where you froze them and then moving the embryos. However, I definitely do move eggs all the time for patients and that's okay too. But I like to think through all the things that I talk through for like the egg whisper diet. I actually have my, a, a new set of another mnemonic that I use for egg thawing as well. And if you go to egg thawing, I think there's a website, it's eggthawingparty.com. I think I have that. Um, you'll see all the steps that I take patients through when it comes to thawing your eggs and talking about where are your eggs, where should they be thawed is one of the steps. So it's super important to feel comfortable, feel good, and make sure they're doing all the right steps for you. 
because your eggs are such a precious commodity when you, especially, I mean, every egg, every embryo to me is a chance for a pregnancy. And so you'd want to make sure that people aren't taking those eggs for granted. And they've done all the tests up front, like the tushy method, like the balls method, all that kind of stuff, like the egg whisperer diet as part of your whole, what I call the egg whisperer plan so that you don't look back and say, God, why didn't I know this? Why didn't I do the DNA fragmentation test first on the sperm? Why did they thaw the eggs when the sperm was really bad? Why didn't they call me? You know, those are the things that aren't going to happen to people who are listening to this show because you know the questions to ask. You're going to say things like, if the sperm quality is really bad, do not thaw the eggs. I want to know what the sperm quality is. And those are in situations where sperm quality is low, but sometimes you need to speak up for yourself, use your voice, advocate for yourself, and continuously ask more questions. Um, let's see here. Age 32, AMH 1.7, stage 3 endometriosis excise. First IVF cycle failed. Only two dominant follicles, 100 milligrams of Clomid, 350 milligrams uh, I use of gonal F protocol issue. So what I would say is when you have stage three endometriosis, that can affect your egg quality. And so this may not be protocol. However, it could be egg quality related. So I would repeat your AMH, look at your FSH estradiol, talk to your doctor about different ways to stimulate your ovaries to see if they can get more eggs out. This could all be endometriosis, but certainly it makes sense to consider other protocol options as well. So next question, can you transfer a monosomy 22? Of course you can. I, I personally would not, but you can do it. Um, age 29, about to start IVF, gonal F once a day and menopure 150, is that okay? The answer is yes. I decide the dose of meds based on the patient's body size, age, AMH, and follicle count. I put it all together with their diagnosis, and then I make a plan. And so what you're, what you're on sounds really good, but you should ask your doctor, what's my diagnosis? Why did you choose this protocol? Why did, how and why did you choose the medication that you chose for me? And what does my IVF pyramid look like? You guys know what the IVF pyramid is, right? The IVF pyramid, the number of follicles you start with and the number of embryos your doctor expects to have in the end. If you guys don't know what the IVF pyramid is and you want to read more about it, go to my website, Dramey, D-R-A-I-M-E-E dot O-R-G, and put in the search engine, what is IVF, and you'll see the beautiful IVF pyramid. I recommend you print it out, bring it to your doctor, and make that part of your pre-IVF consult. And if you guys, while I'm speaking about this right now, if you haven't signed up for the IVF course in my Egg Whisper School, go to eggwhisperschool.com. My next live class is September 14th. And as you guys can tell, I can talk about this stuff all day long. I mean, I could literally be here until tomorrow morning and still have fun. I might need to drink a little bit of water in between, but I'll be here answering questions as long as people have them. And that's how much fun I have doing the IVF class. So do join it if you guys want to learn more. Okay. So... Egg retrieval with no sedation, is it something you would do? The answer is no, it is not something that I would do, um, but that's me. Thank you, just like having a celebrity answer my question. You're very sweet, Nikki. I'm not a celebrity. I'm just someone that's crazy passionate about fertility and educating people. And if that makes me a celebrity, I'll take it. 26 and I was diagnosed with PCOS two years ago. Didn't explain to me how to treat it, but to be on a diet. Oh my God, that is so annoying. So here's my thing. PCOS, think about high testosterone and treating it, irregular periods and treating it, exercise and eating is definitely super important, but check your hormones, balance them, and find a PCOS specialist that really knows what they're doing. I don't know where you live, but feel free to direct message me. And I know, like I'm so lucky to just have this amazing network of fertility doctors that I'm friends with all over the country and world. And if there's a way I can hook you up with someone that's passionate about helping women with PCOS, I'll definitely do it. Next question. I had an ERA test and found out I have plasma cells and already took antibiotics. Does this mean I could have endometriosis? I don't think so. However, as you guys know, I do the receptiva test with the ERA test. It might mean that you have endometritis. I don't know that it means endometriosis, but it's certainly something to ask your doctor about. Look at your ultrasound, see if there's adenomyosis. Think about your fallopian tubes. Is there a chance for a hydrosalpinx? Here's the next question. Any tips for an embryo lining that takes forever to get? Ah, I see what you're saying. So your lining is taking forever to get over eight millimeters on estrogen. So what I would do in a case like that is I would think about what does your lining look like in STEM? So if during your IVF cycle, your lining was awesome and it's just really not growing on the estrogen, I would say, stop the estrogen. It's like, stop the madness. You would be a great candidate for a natural cycle transfer if you're making a gorgeous lining when you're taking STEM meds. So I would just back it up, stop the madness, stop the estrogen. And then at the same time, if it's a situation where your lining is also really thin when you're on STEM, you have to ask, is this related to 
Asherman's syndrome, are, is there scar tissue in the uterus? Let's find out. Let's do a hysteroscopy and do a hysteroscopy with someone who like, this is what they love to do and they're really good at it so that you're prepared. You go in, if there's scar tissue, they'll remove it. They might use a uterine balloon stent or a uterine stent. They might add estrogen to thicken up the lining around the stent. And there are lots of creative ways of helping a lining thicken. Creative ways, meaning like there's not a lot of science to prove that it works, but it might work for some people and we don't know why, like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, HGH use, PRP. You know, these are all things that patients of mine have used successfully. So I would talk to your doctor about more creative ways of helping you if you're feeling like they're just not being that creative. Okay, how much is it to freeze eggs? Do you finance? Yes, uh, in the Bay Area, including medications, around $15,000. Financing companies, Arc Fertility and Future Family, those are the two companies that most of my patients use. Um, hi, Dr. Amy, I want two kids. Uh, I'm 35, husband's 39. We have two blastocysts, 13 fertilized embry, two blastocysts, um, one failed fet. Do I do another stem before laparoscopy because you said the surgeon? Yes, that's easy. If you have one embryo, Remember, step one or stage one, embryo creation, do it. Do that first. Then go to embryo transfer preparation. Unless, of course, your doctor sees like a big endometrioma and they really feel that you'd have better egg quality if they removed any endometriosis. So talk to your doctor about that first. But you're right. If it looks like you have endometriosis, removing it could potentially reduce your egg count. There certainly are situations where I have patients do laparoscopy before another stem, but it's not a one size fits all answer. So definitely talk to your doctor about that first. It's a really good question to get your AMH level checked before you have that discussion so you know where you're at right now. Okay, I love it. Oh, someone just answered my popcorn thing. The white is the pop of the popcorn and the yellow is the corn. Oh my God. Oh, you just made it up and I just said it, but it sounded really good. I love that. Okay, I'm 34 years old, DNA fragmentation, 34%, AMH 0.9. I use DHEA for three months. Do you recommend Ovacetol? I do, but I do recommend thinking about a sperm aspiration or zymote and pixie. Talk to your doctor about what they can do to recommend, what they can recommend for your husband. If testosterone level is low, how are they gonna improve it? Is there a varicose seal? Do you have time to repair it? all super important questions because a DNA frag that high could result in embryos that might look beautiful and have normal chromosomes, but might not have a very high pregnancy or live birth potential. So you wanna learn all about that stuff up front. Repeat the DNA frag. I think of it as a traffic light, green light, go for it, yellow light, gotta do more work, red light, eh, stop for now until further notice, okay? Next question. I'm 41, I run two miles per day. Wow, that's pretty good. My euploid BBB FET is on Monday. What are the chances in your experience the embryo will stick? Also, how long after the transfer can I resume running? Okay, this is the thing. Your euploid embryo probably has at least a 60% chance or better chance of sticking. I said chance twice there. Um, talk to your doctor, ask them that question. Remember my embryo diamonds. Ask them based on the quality, what's my implantation rate? Super, super important. So you have a really good chance of it working. As far as running, I tell my patients, walk, walk, walk positive pregnancy test, run, but only if you're a runner and talk to your doctor first about that recommendation. So I do think women who are athletic can continue to be athletic during their fertility treatment, athletic during their frozen embryo transfer, and then er, stop, halt, two days after the embryo transfer, rest and relax. Boss your cabana boy or girl around if you have one. If not, I'm sure we can find ivfcabanaboy.com. There's some sort of like online service that we can create here, right? That's really funny. Um, I'll have to think about that. Okay, next question. Uh, do you need a prescription for hormones or prenatal vitamins? The answer is yes. You need a prescription for hormones, but not prenatal vitamins. Prenatal vitamins, you can get them anywhere. Do you like using the Dutch test? I don't. I, when I can use blood levels that seem more reliable to me, I don't feel like the Dutch test is that helpful. Um, I'm 38 years old. My AMH is 0.167. My progesterone is 20. My FSH is 3. My estrogen was 150. So I would say you still have a chance for pregnancy. You might be able to get between one and three eggs. Your chances of getting a viable embryo is probably around 10%, but you still definitely have a chance. Um, does FSH not need to be taken during a period? So FSH levels, if you Google image FSH during the menstrual cycle, you'll see it goes like this and then pops up like that and then comes down and like that. So that's for women who have ovulatory cycles. If you're not ovulating at all, you just check an FSH anytime and it can teach you about what's going on with your body. So you don't need to do FSH when you're on your period. You can do it really randomly, but you have to see when you're doing it so it can tell you what's going on. Well, I always have egg white smucus when I ovulate. No, you don't always have it, but a lot of time you do. 
How often would you recommend acupuncture leading up to a transfer? So it's like, that's like telling, that's like asking how often do you need to be seen during an IVF cycle, right? I mean, everyone's different. Everyone's body is different. So I always say, go to the acupuncturist and let them measure your chi. They'll wiggle your ear. They'll rub your elbow. I'm kidding. I have no idea what they do. But I say to them, I'm like, work your magic. Make me look good. Chinese medicine has been around a lot longer than IVF. IVF has only been around for what, 40 years? I think they know what they're doing by now. And there's one thing that they get right. They help my patients feel good, feel relaxed, have less nausea, have less aches and pains, especially during pregnancy. So when it comes to acupuncture, they'll tell you, typically my patients get seen about twice a week. There's a clinic that there are a few clinics that are awesome. One down the street from me, it makes it super convenient for patients to go there, come here go back there with their transfers. They go there, they go to the transfer, they go back there. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Uh, magician. I say that because I saw your patient who agreed you were a magician. That is very, very sweet. Thank you, Heidi. I do talk about fertility medicine like magic. We help patients believe and see that the impossible is possible. I don't know that that's magic. I am certainly not a magician, but I swear I see miracles happen every single day right in front of me. Not because of me, but because I, I, I'm just so lucky to be present when they're there. It's because of you and your resilience. It's all because of you, of your resilience. Anytime a patient says to me, Amy, I'm here because of you and I'm successful because of you. I say, oh no, honey, you got it all wrong. It's because of you and your resilience. And for those of you guys who missed the last show and I didn't show you this at the beginning of this, resilience is rise up, endure the battle, strengthen yourself, identify the challenge, lean in, inhale, exhale, next step, change what you can and embrace the journey. So much of what you do as a fertility patient has to do with getting bad news every single day. And you got to change those thoughts and remember how resilient you truly are. And that's what you embody and you embody resilience. And of course, you guys all sparkle. The egg sparkle to me, I'm probably the only fertility doc. I'm digressing a little bit. I'm probably the only fertility doctor that cries when she sees follicles. <laughs> I swear to God, my patients think I'm nuts. Well, they know that I'm nuts. I'm crazy passionate about fertility. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm going to keep seeing if I have any other questions. I am going on two hours. That is true. <laughs> What are the chances of a 5cc day 7u ploy blast resulting in a uh, successful pregnancy? I would say probably less than 1%. I'm just being honest. Super important to ask your clinic, though, the answer to that question. Um, yes, someone's asking if this will be live on YouTube. The answer is yes. I'm going to post this on YouTube very soon, probably tomorrow. What could be the cause of high DHEA? Could that be bad for fertility? So high DHEA could be a sign of PCOS. It could be a sign of adrenal disorder. High testosterone levels might impair egg quality, and there are really easy ways to reduce your DHEA, like Avocetol, for example. Believe it or not, you can use birth control pills and metformin, but talk to a doctor about another um, evaluation for PCOS or CAH and meet with a, um, a medical endocrinologist as well if your doctor is stumped about what to do because they're super good at these all these fancy tests to figure out why your DHEA level is high and I wouldn't worry about it. It's not super complicated. Here's another great question. What is the chance for transfer success after abdominal myomectomy for multiple fibroids? And the answer is it's pretty good, but make sure you don't have scar tissue in the cavity of the uterus. Make sure you're being ruled out for recurrent fibroids. And then also, whenever I have a patient who has fibroid surgery, I always say, listen, it's possible that your fallopian tubes could have been scarred. And I don't want to see, I don't want to see us transfer and then find out you have an ectopic pregnancy. So patients are like, what? You're doing IVF. Why would you do an HSG again? And for me, it's just one of those things I do. And it doesn't mean that everyone has to do it, but it's a thing that I talk to people about. You guys, there's still so many questions. Wow. And Instagram is saying, hit the road, Dr. Amy. Go take your mnemonics and your cheesy sayings and all your riddles and rhymes elsewhere. And I think I'm going to do that for tonight. Thank you guys for joining me on Ask the Egg Whisperer, and I hope you guys will join me again next week. My next Egg Whisperer school uh, live class is, I think, September 14th. I don't remember right now in this moment, but be sure to go to eggwhispererschool.com and remember to ask more questions. Inhale and exhale, and remember that you deserve all the best things in this life, and your fertility is the most important to you. So if other people are saying, oh, you don't need to worry about that, remember, if it's important to you, you're going to, and you're going to ask more questions, and you're going to get more tests done, and you're going to get another opinion, and you're going to make sure that your path to pregnancy is exactly the way it should be for you and no one else. 
And thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for watching the last hour. Thank you guys for watching this hour. And I love that you guys are here and you're staying with me and you're giving me all those hearts and all this love. And I love, I literally love each and every one of you. You guys are truly my heroes. You guys are truly the warriors out there and you're making this world a better place by doing all the work that you're doing to be a parent. So keep sparkling, keep doing what you're doing and don't let anybody take that spark away. And I want you guys to have a really great night. Listen to some nice electronic dance music. <laughs> Light a candle, drink some tea, and remember life is too short to live your life for other people. And I love you guys, and I'll see you next week. Bye.